Innovation in personal mobility advances freedom and empowers people. The automotive industry has always been the core innovator of individual mobility. There's never been a more exciting time to be part of the transformative forces driving our industry. The possibilities for human transportation and our environment are imminent and real. The technological promise of a cleaner, safer future is in our grasp. Innovations that are transforming personal mobility in ways that most people are only beginning to imagine are happening and accelerating every day, both inside and outside our industry. The promise of future mobility isn't owned or driven by any one sector or company. It'll be, as it always has been, an extraordinary collaboration between industries, tech leaders, government, and the individual consumer. Our challenge is to ensure we keep moving forward together as swiftly as we can, as each innovation combines with others to remake personal mobility. Our job is to tell the story of how this innovation is happening faster than most realize, and to ensure we are collaborating across our society to grasp the possibilities and pave the way for our automotive future. Welcome to Transforming Mobility, the Auto Innovators Summit. I'm John Bazella, President and CEO of the Alliance for Automotive Innovation, the unified voice of the automotive industry. We represent manufacturers producing nearly 99% of cars and light trucks sold in the United States, as well as major automotive suppliers, tech companies, and new entrants to the personal mobility space. All told, 10 million Americans living in every state rely on the jobs we provide to put food on their tables and a roof over their heads. And that gives us an immense responsibility. Today, those of us who work in the auto industry are at the epicenter of sweeping changes, transforming the products and services we make and sell, how we make them, and the very nature of our business. Zero carbon electrified propulsion, automation and connectivity, and changing use and ownership models are tectonic shifts. Separately, each of these revolutions is driving hundreds of billions of dollars of capital investment. Each is changing business models, and each promises cleaner or safer or smarter personal transportation. Taken together, these transformations will likely reinforce and accelerate each other, creating a new 50-year industry cycle of disruption, dematurity, and reinvention. Our industry is at the center of forces and factors that are reshaping geopolitics. Governments worldwide see the auto industry as an essential strategic asset. They are pursuing national and regional strategies to establish leadership, secure the intellectual property and know-how to gain a competitive advantage. The winners of this global competition will draw the supply lines, set the running rules, and define and possibly dominate the international marketplace. During the next two days, we're going to discuss in depth the forces at work within and upon our industry, what our industry is doing to shape and respond to them, and their implications for the economic security of the world's industrial democracies. Today in the US, demand for cars and light trucks is strong, and yet the industry will miss the opportunity to sell three million vehicles to customers this year alone due to supply issues primarily a severe shortage of auto-grade computer chips. Some plants are idled. Dealer inventory is historically low. The auto chip shortage is partly a result of COVID. But over the mid to long term, the increasing technology in advanced vehicles will drive significant increased demand for semiconductors. The challenges across the chip supply chain could foretell problems with automotive supply chains going forward, particularly the minerals, processing, and production required for electrified vehicles. As we speak, the shift to electrification is already underway. Systems and technologies that are making driving more automated and safer are being tested and entering the market. In all of these ventures, there is great opportunity and there are great stakes and it's all taking place against the backdrop of uncertainty. Is the world retrenching from global trade? 
will we be able to obtain critical minerals either domestically or from stable and safe international sources? How will we navigate political polarization, turmoil, and dysfunction here in the U.S. and around the world? Will COVID continue to bedevil economic recovery and global supply chains? Will we heed the calls for equity, inclusion, and diversity in our public and private institutions? The auto industry will play a vital role in addressing all of these questions. Our industry success has never been so closely tied to engagement and cooperation across sectors of the economy and across governments. Fortunately, many policymakers recognize the strategic economic imperative of a vibrant automotive industry. They're asking what can be done to help support private investment to achieve our goals. To build robust consumer demand for electrified vehicles, we will need a charging infrastructure, clean sources of electricity, access to minerals and mineral processing, and more. Automated and connected vehicles will need sensors and more semiconductors. And highly automated vehicles will need a new national regulatory framework for their safe testing and deployment on public roads. We will need resilient and reliable supply chains to support development and markets here in the U.S. so that American workers and the communities in which they work, as well as consumers across the country in every community, benefit. We're going to continue to set ambitious goals for ourselves. We're fully committed to taking on climate change by building zero emission vehicles. And we've embraced the goal of making our fleet 50% electric by 2030. We're incubating technologies that could someday virtually eliminate crashes. And we're developing the systems and networks to combat congestion and expand access to personal mobility in life-changing ways. We've developed and promoted principles to protect the privacy of people who drive our products and principles to monitor drivers to make sure they understand how to use driver assistance features properly. We've presented longer term roadmaps to reduce crashes with a new approach to safety regulation. We've offered our innovation agenda to guide policymakers as we try to deliver the benefits of life saving and clean technologies to the public. The last 20 months have proven that the auto industry is at the forefront of innovation and change, and that the sector remains tremendously resilient. When the pandemic cut sales in half and stopped auto production completely for the first time since World War II, our engineers and manufacturing experts quickly turned to designing and producing devices and equipment to protect the public and treat the pandemic's victims. We are one of the nation's most consequential industries not just as an economic engine and bellwether, but as employers, investors, teachers, innovators, and an engine for opportunity and social mobility. But this summit is not about the last 20 months. It's about the next 20 months and the next 20 years. We've convened this summit because our future depends on stakeholders, policymakers, the tech and energy industries, builders and consumers, dealers and the aftermarket, all driving toward the same destination. During the next two days, we're going to hear from elected officials, cabinet members, government regulators, policy experts, market analysts, advocates, and auto industry leaders. We'll look at how factors from market forces to government actions are helping or hurting the transformation. And we'll examine how key players can collaborate to meet our goals together. Here's what we'll explore in depth what we need to do to successfully deploy automated vehicles, what it will take to increase electrified vehicle sales from today's 3% to the 50% that we all want to reach by the end of this decade, how to maintain resilient supply chains for electrified and automated vehicles, what we can do to build consumer confidence and awareness of advanced safety technologies and driver assistance and monitoring systems, how we can reimagine motor vehicle safety regulations to support future innovation. We hope the discussions of the next two days will help set the agenda for the industry's future, a future built on a strong foundation, a future that leads to a new era of American ingenuity and economic opportunity. I've been in this industry for 25 years, and I've never seen a moment of such promise, excitement, and urgency. We want our discussions during the summit to be frank and open. We're going to hear a diversity of opinions, and we may hear some things that may spark disagreements. But we've got to have this dialogue. We've set our sights on solving some big problems. 
We're transforming the way the world drives and there's room on the road for everyone. Thank you for joining us and taking part in the discussion and debate that will continue to transform personal mobility. Join our discussion online at autos2050.com or use our Twitter hashtags, autos2050 and future of mobility. We're going to begin with a look at the current dynamics in the automotive market. There's no one better able to provide this insight than Tyson Jomini, Vice President of Data and Analytics with JD Power and Power Information Network. As the lead sales and pricing analyst, Tyson will help us make sense of the latest sales data, how the pandemic, supply chain disruptions, and inventory challenges are affecting manufacturers, and the most important trends shaping our industry's future. We entered 2021 with renewed optimism for recovery from the pandemic. So what happened? As we sit here today, we're looking at a most unusual set of circumstances. Demand is strong, production is down, prices are at an all-time high, inventory at an all-time low. Tyson, help us make sense of this market. Well, I could certainly try to make sense. I mean, what I think we're seeing is a, a great convergence. Uh, we're seeing a convergence of, of low production, of very challenged, fragile supply chain mixed with extraordinary demand uh, from consumers. And that's producing record profits for automakers. It's producing record profits for dealers. At the same time, we're seeing a fundamental shift in, in who the buyers are of these vehicles mm -hmm. and even what they're buying. It's all changing at the same time and it's all come together at this exact moment. And that's creating this, this new environment that we're seeing here. Yeah, really, it is, it is new, right? It is extraordinary. Let's unpack that a little bit further. You, you mentioned a couple of things I want, I want to drill down on. One, um, the supply chain, right? I mean, I think anybody, even a casual observer of the automotive industry is familiar with the lack of auto-grade chips, right? Microchips that are missing uh, from vehicles, really in sidelining production, right? So what, tell us a little bit about what's happening there in your view. Yeah, I mean, of course, it's, it's the microchip issue we, we're all familiar with because cars and all vehicles require so many microchips right now um, and the auto companies are competing with the tech companies and and others out there for you know limited capacity of, of microchips but it's not just even microchips i mean if it was just that maybe we we would have a solution pretty quickly i mean it's it's resin for paint it's tires and there's even a story where one individual got covid at in a wiring harness plant that brought down that plant which brought down an entire automaker's production for the month so it, it's kind of this this big convergence of, of these ideas coming together at the same time. Mm. So it's not just chips, it's other elements uh, of the supply chain. I also noticed um, that there's a huge backup uh, at the Port of Long Beach, right? So there's a bunch of uh, container ships uh, that are backed up, that can't be unloaded. There's probably, I would imagine, auto parts and maybe finished vehicles floating out there in the Pacific. Is that true? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we have cars trapped out at sea. Um, we've got cars trapped at port that can't get out. I mean, uh, it, it's kind of hitting us in all these places. And, and the supply chain, again, it's, it's so fragile because it's a global supply chain and this is a global pandemic and a global issue that we've been seeing. If it was just isolated to one or two countries or, or continents, perhaps, uh, there'd be a much quicker route out of this, but due to how widespread the, the coronavirus panic became, it really took its toll on, on the supply chain uh, pretty, pretty much. Yeah. So I want to come to the demand side. So we, 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 you've established, hey, look, there's a, there's a supply problem. So what is happening with demand? I mean, demand seems pretty strong. Um, at, you know, as you mentioned, you also talked about, you know, maybe a new type of customer in the marketplace. What's happening in the marketplace on the demand side? Oh, first of all, demand and sales are completely uncoupled at this point. Um, what we see in the, in the monthly sales reports and the quarterly sales reports do not reflect demand. I mean, we, we lost two and a half million sales last year, and we're on pace to lose two million sales this year. There's a lot of consumers on the sideline that are, are waiting for cars. Um, but, you know, back in April, actually, we saw 
the industry SAR hit 18.4 million as consumers that we we're, were starting to meet that pent up demand. It was starting to, to come back um, at, right as we were running out of vehicles. 18.4 million is the fourth highest SAR of all time. I mean, it only trails 9-11, uh, Keep America Rolling campaign that GM rolled out and, and employee pricing for all. Those are the only events that had higher SARS than what we saw. That's yeah. extraordinary. And I just want to, for, for folks who aren't necessarily familiar with the industry, SAR, you're talking about a seasonally adjusted annual sales rate, right? right? And so that's an annual number that you're looking at, and that's among the highest it's ever been on the demand side. The fourth highest of yeah. all time on an annualized basis. Uh, but within four months, we actually fell down to what I would consider recessionary sales levels. I mean, we went from the highest of highs now down to September. Our SAR was actually, in September 21, was below the SAR of September 08. And if you recall what happened then, that's when Lehman Brothers collapsed. That was sort of the height of the Great Recession. Our volumes right now are below that, even though I just said a minute ago, demand is off the charts. Um, we, have, we have high demand, um, and it's not just that we're selling, uh, the demand is high. Who is buying has changed, and as, as, you know, as, as you alluded to. We've seen a wholesale change in the buyer in the auto industry for the first time in, in arguably 50 years. Baby boomers have been supplanted by millennials, and this is one of the most exciting dynamics because we have a new buying demographic in the auto industry. It, it started in April of, the, of 2020, and we thought, well, it's just kind of a blip. Um, but it's, it's only progressed so that now, as of last month, millennials are 36% of the buyers in the industry compared to 28% for baby boomers. Wait, wait a minute. So th th there used to be a view that millennials won't buy cars. Right? right, that baby boomers are going to be the last, the last great consumers of automobiles, and the, the millennials will not be. So what you're telling me is millennials are in the marketplace in a strong way. Why is that? They did the American thing. It, it just took them a while longer to get there, but they, they coupled up, they procreated, they moved to the suburbs, they, they have soccer games on Saturdays just like Gen X and baby boomers before them. Um, it, it just took them a while longer to get there. They don't love their phones more than cars. They love cars. Um, and they're now the number one buying demographic in 17 of our 27 segments. They're the number one in large pickups, they're the number one in, in most cars, and they're number one in minivans and three-row crossovers. Amazing. So how does the rest of the year look? So you've got this demand and supply uncoupled. Um, what can we expect through the end of 2021 and into 2022? Well, the, the good news is that inventory can't hurt us anymore. And I know that's, that's sort of a, a contradictory statement here because we've been talking so much about inventory. But our inventory has, has really what's been hurting us recently. Sales can't be impacted anymore. So from here, looking into Q4 and into 22, we're gonna see basically supply determining the sales pace. So as we get chips, as we're able to uh, produce vehicles and get those out there, we've got uh, four and a half million consumers sitting on the sideline between retail and fleet. And as vehicles come in, they're gonna buy those. So the inventory situation isn't gonna change in, in 21. And I'm gonna tell you, John, it's really not gonna change throughout most of 22. Really Q4 22 before we start to see inventory begin to build. Wow, so so continued storm clouds and challenges there uh, for, for most of, of 2022. But, it, but is it? I mean, we're we're seeing record transaction prices, record OEM profits, re record dealer profits. I mean, the amount of money consumers are spending in the market is up 20% from 2019. Yeah, so, you know, that's a great way to put it, right? So, in other words, um, you know, this uncoupling actually is, is, you know, creating opportunities for manufacturers, for dealers, and for consumers, again, as the supply chain uh, issues work themselves out, which, which raises another question for me. Um, Will the current model that we see um, in or that we saw before the pandemic can continue um, to be the current model? In other words, you know, I, I would have argued before the pandemic that that manufacturers uh, and dealers were comfortable with a fairly high level of inventory to be able to uh, provide consumers with choices at dealerships. Do you think? that manufacturers and dealers will get comfortable with a new lower level of inventory, for example? Will it change how manufacturers think about the retail side of the business? Well, I think the longer it goes on, the more comfortable everyone's going to get. Um, and so as we've been looking now, this will be a three-year event by the time we get to the end of 22, basically. And that's a long time. There's a lot of, of auto executives and, and retailing executives that are going to grow up and, and, and move into management and executive positions that are, that are used to this new normal. 
And, and so the longer it goes on, the more likely it is that the, the paradigm will, will shift. But you know, after great events um, you know, uh, that have impacted the industry, whether it's the Great Recession um, or uh, you know, uh, the Keep America Rolling campaign after 9-11, the industry has reevaluated how it goes to market. And there's been a lot of, of introspection at this time. I mean, you talk about digital retailing for dealers. That was the only way to do business in 2020 for most, most dealers, how quickly they adapted and, and learned to do that. And now we're talking about uh, lower inventory levels and higher transaction prices. Um, the dealers, they adapt so quickly. They're such great business people. Um, and this opportunity is opening up both for automakers and, and for dealers. At the same time, the kind of vehicles we're changing very rapidly, what we're buying. I mean, EVs are, are up to 3% now. Um, and so it, what we're buying is changing. At the same time, we're getting this opportunity to reevaluate you know, the whole retailing experience. Yeah, I, I love that idea of transformation, not only in the vehicle itself, and in the services that are provided, but also in the retail space. I want to come back to that in a second, but one more question, you know, uh, sort of in the near term. You know, we talked about record high transaction prices right now. Can we expect that those, as the supply chain works itself out and as demand increases, that uh, those those high transaction prices might come down a little bit or stabilize? What's your view about that? Yeah, we would expect those to, to probably stabilize, if not come back slightly. Um, we've seen incentive spending by automakers drop from over $4,000 a unit to $1,700 a unit as, as inventory fell. Um, and we've seen the, the number of consumers paying above MSRP right now is 84% of consumers are paying near or above MSRP. And so these factors are very likely not to continue as inventory starts to come back. As, as we meet this pent up demand. So as we start to really exit 22, we should start to see those pressures come down. I see. And um, I wanna come back to your point about electrification. So lo let's look at the trends that we're seeing in the marketplace and in the industry generally. So you talked about electrification. Before we come back to that specifically, what are some of the other trends in addition to more electrification in the new vehicle fleet? Uh, what are some of the other trends you're, you're tracking uh, with regard to uh, the auto market? Yeah, I mean, of course, we're, we're seeing the continuation of the SUV dominance of, of the industry. I mean, SUV penetration is closing in on 60%. Um, so consumers continue to want SUVs of every every flavor, every size, and every every niche, of course. You know, of course, Bronco being all new and, and the Bronco Sport focusing on that, that hard, uh, hardcore off-road market. Uh, so we'll see a lot of, of trend toward, uh, toward that in vehicles. Um, but in general, um, consumers are, are open to the idea of electrification. Um, we saw vehicles like the RAV4 uh, Prime come to market um, and, and the RAV4 Hybrid and the CRV Hybrid and hybrid share is, is taking off. And because we finally put those kind of powertrains in the vehicles that people want. I mean, we want SUVs. And as we start to, to put alternative powertrains into the kinds of vehicles that people want, we're seeing consumer responses very high to that, that combination. Yeah, so that's a really important point, right? So more vehicle, more, more, more availability uh, across more segments is gonna obviously uh, increase sales, right? So in, um, you know, I noticed, for example, the ID4, the Volkswagen product is really seems to be, uh, you know, targeted at right smack in the middle of the heart of the market, right? Kind of that, what would you call that, a compact or midsize yeah. SUV? Um, you look at the the Mustang E is in addition to the uh, the Toyota products you mentioned. I mean, there's a lot going on, right? Um, so um, that's good for consumers, more choice, right, uh, in, the electric, in the electric drive space. You mentioned 3%. Um, you know, there are goals out there um, that are much more audacious uh, and much more uh, uh, far-reaching. For example, uh, a view that we might be able to get to 40 to 50% of new vehicle sales being electric drive by the end of this decade so effectively eight years from now. Um, so 3% to 40 or 50%, um, what does it take in your view um, to really reach those types of levels if you think we can? What's interesting is we actually took a look at, at electrified or electric specifically pricing in, in $10,000 buckets. And there is an electric vehicle in every price bucket, every car from under 20K up to over 80K. And likewise for SUVs, if your goal is just to buy an SUV or a car that's electric, it's there at every price point up the ladder. So why, you know, why isn't it catching on necessarily even faster than, than it's going? Well, because consumers are 49.5% loyal to their brands. Mm. So we've got to get more brands offering more 
EVs at, at more price points. I mean, the original EV idea we had was let's put an electric powertrain inside a hatchback. And you know, if there's one thing Americans, you know, didn't trust more than electric vehicles, it was hatchbacks. Right. And so we, we put the two together and thought, you know, it would be like the time that chocolate and peanut butter came together to make Reese's peanut butter cups. But the reality, it didn't work. Mm -hmm. um, and so Tesla showed a, a great way to do it, which is electric cars can be sexy, they can be fast and fun. Um, and, and so we see a lot of automakers uh, mirroring that, but what, what we're still missing is that middle part of the market, like I mentioned with, with CRV hybrid and RAV hybrid. That middle part of the market put an electric powertrain in, in the vehicles that, that most consumers are buying. Number one and two segments are midsize SUV, the three row crossovers, and compact SUV. As we start to put electric powertrains there, that will be a very big step forward in, in the electric penetration. Yeah, so I've seen um, forecasts, for example, that um, we might be uh, somewhere around 130 or so uh, different uh, electrified products in the marketplace by mid-decade. Uh, and so that seems to be responsive to the, to, the, to the point you're making. And so there we go, right? Sort of more availability um, response to consumer demand and, and we, can, you know, we can make significant progress. You know, I, I, I know that, um, you know, you're focused a lot on the sales market, but, you know, there are other elements uh, that need to be other building blocks that need to be put in place, right? So, for example, um, do we have sufficient charging um, and hydrogen fueling, for example, uh, for the levels of electrification that we hope to achieve by mid-decade and by the end of the decade, in your view? Yeah, J.D. Power, we just completed a quintet of EV studies. Uh, all five of them, basically the same message came through from, from EV owners and intenders. Infrastructure, infrastructure, infrastructure. We need, we need to see charging units. We need to know that they're there. We need to have the confidence that, that they're going to be at the right place and offering the right type of charging. It's not just, is there a charger where I need it? It's gotta be the right, the right kind, the, the right speed of charger. Um, and so that, that message came loud and clear uh, from consumers directly to JD Power. Um, I, I, wanna, I wanna come to another trend. Um, you know, we, we, when we, we look at electrification, um, you mentioned, you know, the continued strength of the SUV market. You know, we're also seeing more and more um, advanced safety systems coming into the marketplace, uh, as well as, you know, steps toward more highly automated vehicles. Primarily, I would think in maybe in the near term in the fleet space. What's your view on what customers are and aren't buying in the, say, the safety tech space right now? Uh, we've seen a lot of the advanced driving assist systems uh, skyrocket in penetration. Your blind spot warnings, your, your front collision warnings, uh, your rear cross traffic warning systems uh, that automakers are putting in their vehicles go from single digit penetrations to 30, 50, 60 percentage uh, penetration of vehicles in, in the span of about five years. So those are, are going extraordinarily fast. Um, most automakers are making a lot of these safety suites standard. Uh, which is really helping now. Do consumers know they have these features? Do they know what's working when the vehicle starts vibrating? Do they know it's because they're about to back into something or for another reason? Um, so it, perhaps explaining these systems to, to consumers uh, would, would, would be another great step, but we are seeing rapid adoption of these technologies. Yeah, you know, that's a really good point. Uh, you, rapid adoption, that's good. More technology, more safety. But I do think you're, you're, you make a really good point, educating the consumer, making sure that they're aware of what the vehicle is capable of, and perhaps even what it's not capable of right. um, in, the, in the safety tech space would be really important. Um, what about a, another trend um, we often talk about in the auto industry, the shift from maybe ownership to uh, sharing, to access? You know, maybe the pandemic has slowed that down a little bit, maybe not. What's your take on on how consumers will consume mobility, personal mobility going forward. Well, what we saw in the pandemic was the, the areas where your Ubers and Lyfts have the strongest uh, presence. It's also the area with the greatest mass transportation systems, New York, Chicago, San Francisco. And so we saw a lot of consumers move out of mass transportation into the Ubers. Um, but the, for the rest of us, you know, the, the suburb dwelling uh, rest of us out there, uh, the idea during the pandemic of getting in someone else's car was, you know, anathema, like who, who could envision that? Now, I think that's all kind of a, a short term uh, disruption there. Uh, over long term, there'll probably be a greater emphasis on on the shared space, mm. um, reaching more more consumers with it. Certainly, as as the the platforms mature, 
and we see more adoption and more trials there. I mean, I don't know about you, but my parents haven't, haven't even attempted to take a, an Uber anywhere. Right. Um, and meanwhile, I'm asking my wife, can I put my son in an Uber to go to practice? And she's right. like, no way. You know, so they have yeah. two extremes, and I'm kind of in the middle, um, being the one that uses it pretty frequently. So long term, there's probably a, a trend toward that. Uh, mm -hmm. But you know, at the end of the day, you know, back to the, the soccer example. You know, when you've got soccer practice on Saturday and, and you've got to get somewhere else after that and, and you're running around, you need, uh, you need your vehicle that, that can haul all your stuff and be with you. The idea that we're all going to give up our, our cars uh, is, is pretty far-fetched. I think the, the personal ownership of cars are going to continue until, you know, until we're going to grow old with our own individual cars, right. John. Tyson, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. It's my pleasure now to introduce our keynote speaker, Scott Keogh is the Chief Executive Officer and President of Volkswagen Group of America. He's also the head of the Volkswagen brand in North America. He oversees all of the Volkswagen brand activities in the U.S., Mexico, and Canada, and the company's huge facility in Chattanooga, Tennessee, which employs thousands. He also leads engineering, purchasing, research, testing, and logistics activities across North America. Scott's history of overseeing strategic ventures into new vehicle segments and crucial product launches has never been more important as the industry brings electrified products from research and design to the marketplace. Welcome, Scott. Hello, everyone. I'm Scott Keogh, and I'm honored to be part of Auto's 2050 on behalf of the Volkswagen Group of America. Like so many sectors of our economy, these are fascinating times for the automotive industry, defined by astonishing resilience, even as we navigate unprecedented disruption. And frankly, it's only the beginning. Over the next decade, we will undergo more transformation within our industry than we've experienced in the past 130 years. Arguably, since the blink of an eye in which we stabled the horse and buggy and redefined horsepower. To help understand what that transformation will take, let's go back to that very moment in time. When under the cloak of darkness, a war was fought right here on American soil that most of us have never heard of. It wasn't a war of military strength. It had nothing to do with politics or ideology. It was a war of ideas fought by industry titans armed with nothing more than the innovations they were convinced could change the world. They called it the War of the Currents. On one side was Thomas Edison. On the other, George Westinghouse. Caught in the middle, the electrification of America and the illumination of its future. Though he won the battle for the light bulb, Edison ultimately lost this far more important war. Westinghouse proved, with the help of a Serbian immigrant by the name of Tesla, that alternating current was superior when it came to transmitting the power needed to light those bulbs and pretty much every other electrical device we now take for granted. Using transformers, to knock down high voltages, then safely distribute power to households across the country, AC could go to distance. Edison's direct current simply couldn't. As one historian put it quite well in a modern context, if Edison's idea had won, there would be a coal-burning power plant every two miles crisscrossing America. But key to the drama were two very public-facing and at least partially publicly funded ideas. The use of alternating current to illuminate nearly 100,000 incandescent light bulbs and the imaginations of almost 30 million visitors at Chicago's World Fair of 1893, and the installation of AC generators at Niagara Falls in 1895, which brought hydroelectric power to the masses. From the lights of Broadway to every borough of my beloved New York. As a history nerd, the War of the Currents has always fascinated me. As someone fortunate enough to be at the helm of a car company in America right now, though, it's a tale of equal parts caution and inspiration. It's easy to get distracted by the personalities involved. They have, of course, become mythical figures in American business and culture. But though the story began with them, countless others helped write its dramatic ending. Key to the narrative are the countless social and political leaders at the national, state, and even local levels who work behind the scenes to force the healthy competition and shape public opinion to make this mass adoption possible. Leaders like many of you watching here today, what happened in Chicago and in Niagara Falls was the result of private industry working lockstep with government entities to not only bring innovations to life, 
but to create moments in the marketplace where consumers could just see how life-changing these innovations were, and perhaps more importantly, believe that change was a good thing. I mentioned it's estimated that almost 30 million people saw those twinkling lights at the 1893 World's Fair. That was over the course of six months and represented one quarter of the entire U.S. population at the time. They had read the articles. They had heard the stories. Now they had to see it for themselves. And just like that, they believed. They believed in American-made magic at its best. Of course, gone are the days when one company, let alone one name, can or should own any market. Or, in the case of the auto industry, the road ahead. It will take each and every one of us within this industry, icons and upstarts alike, to chart a new course and illuminate that road toward a cleaner, safer, and smarter future. And there is no greater market opportunity than electrification. For our part, Volkswagen has undoubtedly gone all in on EV development, committing more than $41 billion globally to accelerating our drive toward electrification and CO2 neutrality. At Stateside, I'm proud to say next year, we'll begin assembly of our first electric vehicle down in Chattanooga, Tennessee, where we invested an additional $800 million to expand our existing footprint to create nearly 1,000 career-defining jobs in everything, from entirely new battery technology to traditional assembly. The ID4 is our opening salvo to bring electrification to millions, not just to millionaires. But it is just the tip of the spear. We are preparing to bring enough EVs to the market to increase our current annual sales mix of 6% to an anticipated 50% by the end of this decade. But we simply cannot do it alone. Moreover, we don't need to because the American market is clearly charging up for change. Year to date, we've sold over 12,000 ID4s, a testament to the enthusiasm our 600 plus dealers had for its arrival and their commitment to embracing the change. Granted, it also helps that it has quickly become the number one most profitable vehicle for our dealers, helping us collectively return to profitability in North America for the first time in decades. But there's a bigger story here. For starters, 90% of those sales are first time EV buyers and they're cross shopping non-EV offerings from badges such as Toyota, Honda, and Ford. A look at broader market research reveals an even more staggering fact. Over 70% of American drivers, they are ready now to go electric. So I, for one, welcome every headline announcing that our colleagues are joining the party. From General Motors to Lucid, racing toward 2050 and beyond. But like any great American road trip, we've got a long way to go and a short time to get there. So we need you riding shotgun. Consumers are savvy enough to understand that EVs pay off in the long run. They know they can save thousands in fuel costs and maintenance over an EV's lifetime compared to a gas-powered vehicle. But between leaps in battery technology and increased competition, they also see prices falling year after year. So it's no surprise that so many Americans are ready to go electric. And this moment points to the opportunity before us, once again as a nation. The EV market is only just starting to take shape. To ensure that market has its best chance to flourish, the private and public sectors need to rekindle that classic spirit of partnership to break down any and all barriers to EV adoption among American consumers. Automakers are already acting quickly to overhaul decades old supply chains and even share cutting edge technology to bring EVs and their benefits to the market. Some of these actions are in response to regulation. Most, however, are now by choice because I can ensure the entire industry has shifted its thinking to not only doing what's good for business, but also what's good for the planet. Like ACDC so long ago, the debate is over. A superior technology that can be cleaner, safer, and smarter is winning. But according to a report by energy research firm Bloomberg NEF, 2023 is the point when experts believe EVs will match the price of comparable gas-powered vehicles. So until then, the invisible hand needs to simultaneously keep just the right amount of pressure on the scale to tip the market in consumers' favor. To the point, 
Regulating the automotive industry simply is not enough. The government can and should create as much incentive as possible for drivers to go electric because incentives without a doubt work. The ID4, for example, has been selling so well here, partially because it's only $32,500 for customers who can take advantage of the federal tax credit, well below the $38,000 sticker price of an average new vehicle in 2020. Incentives like these will continue to enable the market to gain strength and find its footing. To be clear, they are not intended to be a long-term strategy. They are a short-term bridge to long-term economic growth. Because these incentives don't only benefit consumers, they simultaneously cut greenhouse gas emissions on American roads while creating jobs in communities across this great nation. It's clear the Biden administration and congressional leaders on both sides of the aisle support the goal for increased electrification. But it's also clear that recent congressional efforts have incorrectly focused on incentives that favor some automakers over others, limiting consumer choice to a select few and potentially weakening the EV market. The EV tax credit proposal recently released by the House Ways and Means Committee artificially distorts the marketplace against companies like Volkswagen, discriminating against our nearly 4,000 employees in Tennessee, let alone those who are part of a supply chain linking us to states from coast to coast. Make no mistake, though we have German roots, after billions in investment and economic output, Volkswagen of America is very much an American company defined by proud Americans assembling quality American products, many of whom who have fought to preserve the America they love. Policies that favor U.S. workers in one region over U.S. workers in another region are wholly unfair. Full stop. Federal incentives should be focused on building a strong, fair, and national EV market that accelerates national adoption, ensuring that this next chapter in electrification is once again written right here in the U.S. of A. After all, from Norway to China, we've seen that rapid, widespread EV adoption happens when government works hand in glove with industry on a national scale to create enough runway for the EV market to take off. We all want to see the same benefits to our economies and our ecosystem others have already reaped in electrification. And with incentives that help put people in the driver's seat, we can create a homegrown EV market that is the envy of the entire world. So it's time to lead, not follow. American drivers want a great car at a great price. The question is, what kind of car do we want to build for them? We could let market forces dictate that, or for just a little while longer, we could level the playing field. Incentives and rebates have helped Americans make smarter purchases that in turn have made us a more efficient nation. Because it's everywhere, it's easy to overlook this little logo. Energy Star is of course the government-backed symbol for energy efficiency. Since 1992, it has helped American families and businesses save five trillion kilowatt hours of electricity, avoid more than 450 billion in energy costs, and achieve an astonishing 4 billion metric tons of greenhouse gas reductions. Over the lifetime of the program, every dollar the EPA has spent on Energy Star resulted in $350 in energy cost savings for American businesses and households because it made it easier to make better purchase decisions. Visit energystar.gov and you can scroll through countless offers to lower the cost of everything from smart thermostats to commercial dishwashers. So why not put an Energy Star on an ID4 or at least apply the logic behind it? The simple truth is that unless they look at similar gas and electric vehicles and see similar prices, consumers will balk and the electric market will sputter at a time when it should be roaring to life, albeit a quieter roar. Ladies and gentlemen, therein lies the opportunity. Together, we can prove taking the wheel is more than the obligation of a generation. It's the chance of a lifetime to conjure some American-made magic. Already, private-public partnerships are proving to be critical to electrification. ID4 owners have charged over 4 million kilowatt hours to travel 12 million miles, raving about the experience 
and evangelizing the benefits of going electric. And that is in large part thanks to an expanding charging infrastructure. And many of you know, our wholly owned subsidiary, Electrify America, offers nearly 2,600 individual fast chargers across the United States. By the end of this year, that number will climb to 3,500 DC fast chargers at 800 stations in 45 states with two cross-country routes and networks running up the length of both the East and the West Coast. By 2025, Electrify America plans to more than double those numbers with more than 1,800 charging stations and 10,000 individual chargers. All in, Electrify America is investing $2 billion over 10 years in zero emission vehicle infrastructure, education, and access. And those efforts will be bolstered by additional investments from the federal and state government to remedy the so-called range anxiety that stood as a barrier of entry for consumers for far too long. What's more, the pandemic and its resulting semiconductor shortage put a spotlight on our industry-wide need to domesticate the supply chain and minimize our exposure to global risk. Again, this is where we are already seeing big commitments from bipartisan leadership to address these fundamental vulnerabilities and opportunities throughout the American economy. In the aftermath of the current war, from the Windy City and the Empire State, public-private partnerships help spread electricity across America. Edison's light bulbs became omnipresent. Think about this. In 1881, those bulbs cost about $1, which is $23 in today's dollars. By 1910, the cost dropped to 17 cents. Illumination was no longer reserved for the parlors of the wealthy. It belonged to everyone. Private investment in innovation, coupled with public investment in adoption, made the difference. And then, Westinghouse's generators made days longer and nights shorter. Rural outposts were connected to the grid and reimagined through massive infrastructure projects from the Hoover Dam to the Tennessee Valley, which of course is why Volkswagen calls Chattanooga home today. Ironically, in its early years, the automotive industry was actually producing more vehicles powered by electricity than gasoline. So how did gas win? It wasn't just a battle between competing technologies. It wasn't market forces. It was politics without principle. With the most significant government policies creating at best unfair markets and at worst monopolies. A host of mechanisms with perhaps unforeseeable consequences from land grants and government backed bonds to tax deductions for drilling costs and public funding for oil and gas research paved the road to this moment in time for our industry and our nation. A moment of environmental and economic urgency. But here we are at a crossroads with an entirely new horizon illuminated in the not too distant future. Research shows that the first 15 years of any new technology are critical and that government support is key to survival. Every utility and every industry that we now take for granted, from the telephone to the internet, thrived in that way. And frankly, the oil and gas industries have had more than enough time and support. E-mobility deserves it now. History has indeed proven just how powerful market incentives and infrastructure investments can be in changing the conversation and frankly the world. Volkswagen is grateful to be part of a new conversation. We are proud to be bringing e-mobility to Americans at scale. Again, building affordable EVs right here in America for the millions, not just the millionaires, because we believe it is time to democratize this revolutionary technology. From our headquarters, here in Virginia, just miles from our nation's capital to our plant in the heart of a southeastern manufacturing hub where EV investment is booming. We are well positioned with the ambition, the talent, and the industrial know-how needed for the next century of electrification. This time though, it doesn't have to be a war. It's simply a matter of choosing to do this the right way that benefits all workers and all consumers because it's the right thing to do. And it's a choice we can make together. Hi, I'm Brian Seleski, founder and CEO of Argo AI. I'm grateful to John Bozella and the Auto Innovators for hosting this important event. At Argo, we're building self-driving technology you can trust. 
We're based in Pittsburgh and partnered with Ford and Volkswagen to integrate our self-driving technology with their vehicles for commercial ride hail and goods delivery services across Europe and the U.S. Argo is testing in eight cities and counting, giving us the largest urban footprint of any autonomous vehicle technology company. We also have an incredible team of the best robotics talent in the world. We are positioned to scale commercial deployment of self-driving cars around the world in the coming decade. To do this, we're constantly innovating. One example of this innovation is our proprietary LiDAR sensor. Argo LiDAR offers long-range sensing of 400 meters, high-resolution and photorealistic imaging, and the ability to detect the smallest, most difficult-to-see objects that don't reflect much light. This technology is a breakthrough. It has the long-range, high-resolution, and low-reflectivity detection critical for safe self-driving operations in complex urban and high-speed environments. But we're not just building technology, we're building a business. Argo is also making strides in proving the commercial use cases of our technology. Recent partnerships with Lyft and Walmart in multiple cities show our ability to deploy people moving and goods delivery services at scale. People often ask me what autonomous vehicles will enable. First, think of a ride hailing experience where you're the only person in the car, where you have the privacy to take a phone call, where your music and cabin temperature are already set when the car arrives, where you just get in and go. Second, consider goods delivery. AVs can help small and large retailers alike provide affordable same-day delivery to customers. Improving customer experience is but one of the opportunities AVs can provide. The biggest opportunity, though, is improving safety. After years of highway fatalities trending in the wrong direction, we're again at an inflection point for automotive safety. Autonomous vehicles hold the promise to improve safety and transportation efficiency. We in the United States need to act decisively to realize that potential and remain a global leader. Just look at what happened in 2020. Despite a 13% decrease in vehicle miles traveled, fatalities increased 7% compared to 2019. That is unacceptable. The deaths of 38,000 people a year would be categorized as an epidemic if they were caused by a health condition or disease, and that has to change. When you look back at our recent history, there have only been a few key moments and innovations that have significantly improved auto safety and reduced deaths. The passage of the Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Act in 1966 was one, the advent of seatbelts was another, as was the incorporation of airbags into vehicles and the mandate for electronic stability control in 2012. Autonomous vehicle technology offers the next major inflection point for the industry. Autonomous vehicles won't get drowsy or distracted or text and drive. In fact, autonomous vehicles are able to acquire new skills faster than humans. And those learnings can be scaled to an entire fleet further improving safety. They will help enable mobility opportunities for those who have traditionally been left behind and can save lives in the process. Moreover, the Pittsburgh-based Regional Industrial Development Corporation released a study last month showing our industry's economic impact on the region. That includes the creation of 6,500 jobs, 650 million in labor income, 35 million in state and local tax, and over 127 million in federal tax revenue. And by 2026, that study shows our industry could be worth a trillion dollars globally. But at the end of the day, we have policy hurdles to overcome to make this a reality. To see this innovation get to the next level, we need partnership and collaboration in policymaking that supports our entrepreneurs and their companies. Otherwise, this innovation will stall and we will cede our technology leadership to other countries such as China. Our industry's rapid evolution and its potential to improve safety and transportation efficiency and contribute to our economy indicate that the time is now for United States to institute a national framework for the deployment of autonomous vehicles. Just this year, Germany became the first nation in the world to pass a law enabling the deployment of autonomous vehicles. We understand that the European Union, France, and the United Kingdom are working on their own similar laws and regulations. If we don't establish a similar framework in the United States, 
We risk ceding the potential benefits of this technology to other parts of the world. The lack of a legal and regulatory certainty in the United States makes it difficult to plan for the future and have faith that we will be able to deploy when the technology is ready. So what does industry need, understanding that safety must come first? We need clear federal safety standards for AVs, and those take time to write. So we need a bridge to commercial deployment which comes in the form of expanded Safety Act exemptions to allow AV deployment at scale and help provide safety regulators the critical data they need to write new standards. I want to stress here that these exemptions aren't granted as a matter of course. They require strenuous demonstration of equivalent safety, tend to have stringent conditions attached to them, and must be affirmatively approved by NHTSA after a public comment process. Lastly, we need clarity that federal safety standards apply uniformly throughout the United States. That said, we think states should continue to exercise their traditional authorities, for example, with respect to vehicle licensing, inspections, insurance, and liability. Congress has been working on legislation for the past four years, and the administration also has tools at its disposal to clear some of the barriers to deployment we currently face while always putting safety first. We're not asking for a free pass. We're asking for clear rules of the road. And the time to provide them is now. The future of the industry and U.S. leadership in infrastructure, robotics, and artificial intelligence depend on it. Argo stands ready to help in any way it can. We've just heard from an innovator and entrepreneur who is at the leading edge of personal transportation technologies that could become a trillion dollar industry and bring us to the next major inflection point in road safety. We also learned that other countries are adopting policies to support the development and deployment of these advanced technologies in an effort to give themselves a lead in the global competition for automated and connected transportation. What does this policy environment look like? That's what our next panel is going to discuss. Well, thank you, John. Hello and welcome everyone. I'm the transportation correspondent for Axios and I co-author the Axios What's Next newsletter, which looks at the future of cities and work and transportation and really just how technology is so rapidly changing our lives. You know, I've been covering the auto industry for 30 years almost now, and it's never been more interesting to cover. Uh, what we're seeing when it comes to autonomous vehicles is that they have evolved from sort of this novel science project to a potentially life-changing technology that can address some of America's most pressing uh, transportation and mobility issues. We're talking about everything from driverless robo-taxis and self-driving trucks uh, to urban delivery robots and maybe even privately owned consumer AVs. All of them are likely to play a big role in the pursuit of a cleaner, safer, and even more accessible transportation future in the U.S. And you know, it's not just the major global automakers that are pursuing this technology either. We've got some of the biggest giant tech companies and uh, a lot of innovative startup companies as well that are pouring billions of dollars into the research, development, and testing uh, in preparation for autonomous vehicles being safely uh, deployed. But there are plenty of skeptics too, and both in the general public and the policy making community. So education is gonna be very critical uh, as we roll this technology out. That's why I'm so excited to be joined by today's expert panel. They come from three different AV companies, uh, AV startups in fact, but they share one very interesting thing in common. They all served as regulators of autonomous vehicles in the federal government. So they each have very different perspectives and they've seen this from both sides. So I'd love to introduce them now as they join our discussion. Uh, James Owens is the head of regulatory affairs at Neuro, the robot delivery company. He's also a former acting administrator at NHTSA and a former deputy counsel for the US Department of Transportation. 
Mark Rosekind is Chief Safety Innovation Officer at Zooks, which is working on a uh, robo-taxi service and has developed its own uh, vehicle. He was also a NHTSA administrator and he served on the National Transportation Safety Board. And finally, we have Nat Buse, who is Vice President of Safety at Aurora. That's an AV technology company that is delivering, uh, a developing technology that could be used in a, a number of applications. They're gonna be starting out with heavy trucks. He also oversaw vehicle safety uh, as a uh, uh, associate administrator at NHTSA. So welcome to all of you. We're really looking forward to the discussion. Let's get started. You know, each of your companies is coming at this from uh, at a different angle. You're all going into a different segment of autonomy. And I'd like to hear from each of you what the particular safety challenges are that your company is facing and what you're doing to address those issues. Um, let's start with James. Thanks, Joanne. And, and uh, first of all, thank you to uh, Auto Innovators uh, for, for inviting us. This is a great panel. Great to be here with Mark and Nat. Um, so uh, Neuro, as you mentioned, uh, we are building, uh, developing and building um, a uh, zero occupant vehicle delivery robot. So the, the idea here is this is last mile, effectively last mile or local delivery of everything from food from a restaurant or goods from a pharmacy up to including groceries and parcel posts uh, going forward. So it's uh, we're, we're looking to replace a lot of the, um, the, uh, the, the vehicles on the roads that are much heavier vehicles driving on surface streets. And by having zero occupant vehicles, we think there's a, there's a safety advantage to that. Uh, and and, uh, and that, that's involved in, but, but not only do we want to have on one hand the, the safety that everybody in this industry wants to achieve with autonomy, but also by taking humans out of the vehicle, we think that there's an opportunity here for uh, reducing overall human exposure to risk on the roadways. And that's something that's uh, going to exist for the, for the foreseeable future. So by removing humans out of these vehicles, there's less, there's less exposure that occurs. So that's an additional margin of safety. And of course, since the vehicles are not designed to have humans inside. These are vehicles then that can be redesigned with the notion of maximizing safety for people on the outside of the vehicle. So, so uh, for pedestrians and uh, other vulnerable road users, as well as uh, uh, programming the autonomy to behave in ways that would be uncomfortable, I think, for uh, occupants of a vehicle, but the vehicle can stop more sharply or take uh, action in, in a way that uh, might not be appropriate if, if there's a, a human being on board. So we think that that's a, an incredible advantage. Uh, we're really looking forward to, to uh, a, as we continue to de uh, develop and deploy this technology. Of course, the challenges, I think, are, are something that everybody faces. Uh, anytime you drive on a surface street in the United States, surface transportation is an incredibly complex environment with a lot of moving parts and so there's a lot of work to do on the autonomy side to make sure that uh, that that we're seeing uh, the the kind of safe driving that we all want to see going forward I think in addition you know anybody who's developing a new innovative design vehicle uh, needs to make sure that of course we're staying on the right side of the regulators and and existing safety standards so we uh, we are building hardware of course that will meet the the, the safety standards that's the goal um, but going forward, of course, one of the things I think everybody in this industry would like to see is that if uh, uh, is that if if NHTSA can start removing some of the unnecessary barriers uh, for the old standards that reflect manually driven cars and start updating, modernizing those standards to reflect vehicles that might have novel or new configurations and may require different kinds of safety standards. Right, there's a lot of work to be done uh, to to enable that. But um, you know, Mark, your company Zooks uh, is moving people, uh, but with no driver. Um, tell us, you know, what your concerns are, how your vehicle will communicate with uh, uh, people, pedestrians, and cyclists outside, and um, you know what your safety challenges are. And thanks, Joanne, because I think you set this up by identifying there are actually multiple models, right, using new technology. And people go right to AVs, and the reality is there are all kinds of other support kinds of technologies that are pretty important right now as well. And so for Zooks, we are focused on a robo-taxi model um, that is fully autonomous, so we're going right to that level four, level five. It's all electric and bi-directional, no front or back, basically. So I mentioned that because Basically, it's been designed 
to operate in a congested city. Okay, so to your point, the safety challenges that Zooks will face have to do with the dynamic, complex environment of operating within a city. So you've got uh, people in the vehicle, you've got people around the vehicle, double parked vehicles and narrow roads, all kinds of safety challenges that you're not gonna see on an open road or just with packages. So again, you have a different model. We picked specifically operating in cities to help with congestion, sustainability, all the things we know that can be improved there. Uh, and I would just say, you know, the biggest safety challenge is the complexity and how dynamic that environment is. Because as you're pointing out, you have to protect the people in the vehicle, but all the other road users as well. And at Zooks, that includes using sound and light to communicate with people so they know what's going on with the vehicle. What happens when you lose that cross the, cross the crosswalk and you're trying to get your eyes locked with the person behind the wheel and that goes away? Well, you can use light, sound, and other means to try and communicate with all those other road, road users around you. Right, right. Okay. And, and that... Uh... Talk to us a little bit about the challenges of uh, autonomous trucking. Uh, you know, in, in many people say, hey, that's the easiest thing. You just got to drive in a straight line. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'm sure that is not uh, uh, as easy as it sounds. Uh, and yeah, I do, you know, we, we have heard that trucking will in fact be the first application uh, of this in a, in a large commercial deployment. So talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, uh, sure, Joanne. And uh, thanks again to Auto Innovators for, for having this this group together. It's, it's been a while since I think all three of us have actually talked to each other in the in the same format. So this is this is really great. And I think give an opportunity to, to share uh, just kind of how all these things fit together, because I think like Mark was saying, sometimes there's a tendency to go to one thing and this thing is actually a little bit more complicated than that. And so for for, for trucking, there are there are a couple of things I would say that are that are challenges in addition to what has already been mentioned. So one is you, you have to be able to deal with the commercial load that you're you're carrying. So we're doing pilots right now, for example, with FedEx to sort of gain that experience because it matters on how you program autonomy to deal with those sort of dynamics on, on the roadway. And yeah, for sure, I wish it was just driving in a straight line, but for sure it's not. You know, we've got to be able to lane change. We've got to be able to nudge around different uh, vehicles. Um, and we even have to deal with pedestrians. A lot of people will say that, well, it's on the highway. You don't have to worry about pedestrians. In fact, uh, we have seen uh, not one, but several pedestrians and not next to broken down uh, vehicles, uh, just casually taking a stroll on, on the highway in, in Texas. So this is sort of an interesting phenomena uh, that we need to account for and deal with. Uh, and really this comes down to understanding the operational design domain that you're going into and understanding all of the capabilities that, that you need to do that. And so we've, we've all talked about sort of the uh, engineering side of developing the driver. But to me, there's also another ch challenge that actually transcends all three of these companies. And it's really around uh, how you talk about the safety that you're putting into the product overall. So, you know, we, we put out, of course, the safety case framework, which is our way of showing kind of our work on how we're doing that. Uh, but that's really important because the challenge that we're all going to face is, is public public trust, as, as you mentioned. Uh, and, and that's kind of a big thing, as well as making the vehicle safe. It's also like how do you convince and share uh, in a very transparent way with the public why they should think you're able to be out there anyway. And it actually starts now. I mean, we're doing that today with even our current vehicle operators and sort of explaining how, how they're trained and what are all the things that we go through to make sure that when a piece of code lands on the vehicle, that it's actually safe to be on there, regardless of whether we have a VO or not. Right. Okay. Now, well, as former regulators, uh, I, you know, you all have a very close eye on what's happening in Washington, I'm sure. And uh, the, the question I have, it, it seems like the technology is getting very close to deployment, uh, but will the policy and regulatory framework be ready? I mean, James talked already a little bit about the challenges of uh, uh, you know, vehicles that don't have human occupants and, and how those are special, uh, special cases right now, but they will need to be new regulations around that. Um, let's start with Mark. How, how do you feel, uh, we, you know, where we are in terms of the, the regulatory uh, uh, environment? Yeah, Joanne, it's so important to start here with regulation and then immediately move to realize that NHTSA and DOT actually have a whole suite of tools to promote safety. I mean, that's what the regulations are about, is promoting safety. And at the agency, at NHTSA in particular, you can have safety programs that are educational, 
right, and that do enforcement and other kinds of things. You have the new car assessment program. You've got regulation. You've just got policy statements that can do things. There's a large suite of tools that allow you to promote safety in all these areas. So specifically around regulation, I always warn people, they take a long time. So as administrator, the things I actually signed into law were in the pipeline eight to 10 years. Matt will tell you rear view, 10, 12 years, rear view cameras. You know, it's like these things take a long time. So when people say, well, the regulations are going to be behind, it's like, yeah, they're pretty much always going to be behind because, you know, if you think about it, the government doesn't actually create these things and deploy them, right? They're being responsive to whatever the industry is actually creating. And so I think what's really important about your question is regulation is a very powerful and critical tool, but the agency really needs to be thinking about the full range of tools that are available that it can use to promote safety. And one of the challenges, which you've already highlighted, is it's not like they have one model that they have to regulate. You've got delivery and trucks and robo taxi, right? And then all the ATIS right, the advanced driver system systems of wealth, that's not one thing, that's like a whole bag of stuff um, that's gonna be out on the roadways. So in that case, the agency really needs to use its full set of tools to try and promote safety. You know, I think some people would be surprised to uh, learn that the states are also going to play a big role in uh, regulating how this technology comes out. Um, James, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. So, um, well, first of all, I'll uh, echo what Mark said, that the regulators have, uh, whether you're state or federal, <clears throat> they have a, a lot of tools in their tool chest. And, uh, and the question that should be asked is not, are the regulations ready? I think it's, it's what do we want to achieve? And, and, how, and, then, and then from there, how do we get there? And I think, I think if we want to see the benefits of ADS uh, and the, sa the safety potential of it, and we want to see this develop and then deploy on a widespread basis, I think then all the regulators, state and local, uh, or state and federal, I'm sorry, need to, need to think about what are the tools available to them to both incentivize it to occur, remove the barriers that you know, uh, 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 stand in the way of it occurring, but also ensure that as the development and deployment is occurring, it's being done in a safe and responsible way. Uh, one of the areas here, as you mentioned, is the state. So um, you know, the, the traditional breakdown of regulation of vehicle safety in the United States is that the feds, uh, NHTSA, regulate uh, vehicle technology and the states regulate vehicle operations. I think where ADS is going to be an interesting challenge going forward for everybody is that ADS is a hybrid of the two. You can't, you can't divorce the operational safety from the technology itself. And so there's going to be a lot of questions, I think, about how the feds and the states should work together moving forward. Last year, NHTSA uh, launched the AV test initiative, and the purpose of that was to bring the states and the federal government and developers together to talk more about these issues, start working through these issues now and not, not kick the can until the day when ADS, uh, you know, NHTSA is ready to start regulating ADS. I think we need to have those conversations now because at some point, the states are gonna to have to be comfortable with NHTSA taking action that could implicate some operational issues. And NHTSA needs to be well-educated, I think, by the states about what are the operational issues and how best to approach that. So it, this is gonna be an interesting challenge, I think, over the next decade plus, as, as this technology begins to deploy. And we're gonna see, uh, we're gonna see you know, challenges from at the state level and at the federal level. Nat, how do you see the, that conflict, that, that uh, uh, tension between states and the federal government playing out? What, what are ways that we can avoid a, a patchwork of regulatory environments? Because I'm sure Mark does not want to deploy his taxis only in San Francisco. Uh, <laughs> you know, we want them, we want delivery robots everywhere. We want trucks everywhere. Uh, this is a unique situation. How does it get solved? Right. Yeah. Really. Thanks uh, for the question. I, I'll go at it in a couple of different ways. So, because we're also working on uh, ride sharing as well. I mean, we have a great partnership with Uber and a great partnership with Toyota. So, many of these same issues apply to us. But we get to do with it all, and I and I mean that in the most sincere way, right? Because we're doing commercial trucking, which also implicates the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration, which also has a different regulatory oversight and arrangement with the Commercial Vehicle Safety Alliance. Uh, the police enforcement that's used for that kind of segment of the of the roadway, and and these all these folks need to have a seat at the table. Uh, I think one of the things uh, in each of the Mark's tenure and James's tenure, 
one of the things that the federal government did very well was to kind of bring people together, um, specifically talking about the convening power that USDOT ha has in order to get all the stakeholders and the right stakeholders at the table to talk about the issues that need to be addressed. I think one of the things uh, that maybe help clarifying for the audience is when you talk about the self-driving technology itself, so for us, that's the Aurora driver. We're, we're good from a federal level, right? Um, and in most states, we're, we're good. It actually has driven where we are deploying because of you know restrictions in some states that don't even allow self-driving. That's, that's one thing that definitely needs to be solved and be, and be worked on. But from an initial deployment status, actually what we have right now from just the core technology is actually workable. The issues come in when you have these different kind of product offerings, we'll call them, when you want to change the vehicle design, when you want to do other things, let's say with respect to going across state lines, and all of these things now start to complicate uh, kind of commercial application, depending on what you're doing with an individual product. Again, for us on trucking, we sort of map that out and kind of know exactly what we're doing and what that, that leeway looks like in the different states that we plan to go into. But if we wanted to wake up today and pull the driver, let's say in Texas, we can do that, right? When, when, when we think we're safe and ready, but we can't do that in California right now because of the restrictions on commercial trucking. And so, you know, I think the federal government has a big role to play in convening folks and getting them together. I think reinforcing the issue that uh, James brought up with respect to the, well, I, mean, I don't really like using the terms traditional state and federal because I don't think there's anything traditional about what we're getting ready to do. Uh, but, but, but I think reinforcing, uh, particularly at the state level, that NHTSA has a lot of tools and states don't need to replicate those, those tools for vehicle safety. And that there's other issues that are with, well within their purview that they need to, to kind of continue to work on. Operations, licensing, insurance. Those are things that the states are very well adapt at. And the, other, and the last thing I'll say is, we tend to also only talk about this at the state level, but there's also been an interesting thing happening with localities that also needs to be uh, kind of addressed and, and kind of in our minds, which is, you can imagine a scenario if every locality then stood up and said, well, hey, if it's up to me to be responsible for the safety of this thing, I'm going to say no, or I'm going to say yes, or whatever. And then within a state, you could have different uh, rules. And that would just be something that would, I think, particularly crush the benefits of this technology that are beyond our wildest dreams. I think Nat has just described why all of you have jobs at these companies, because <laughs> this is the stuff you have to sort out. <laughs> um, you, know, you know, I've noticed that um, uh, NHTSA seems to be taking uh, perhaps a more aggressive stance when it comes to uh, oversight of uh, uh, assisted driving technology, ADAS systems, like Tesla Autopilot. These are not full autonomy, but I'm curious if you would agree and how that might affect how and when you can roll out uh, full autonomy. How does the ADAS situation affect the rollout of full autonomy, if at all? Yeah, I can start with that. I, I think it's made it more complicated. Um, I think in some fantasy world, uh, a bunch of engineers came up with all these levels. And I guess I was part of that fantasy world initially because NHTSA had its own levels at one point. But it was a tool for engineers. It was never meant to be a tool to communicate to the public. And somehow we took an engineering tool and said, well, it's good enough for engineers. We'll use it for the public, which has <laughs> never been the case. And so we have this mass confusion now going on with technology that's on roads today that actually saves lives, something like automatic emergency braking, being mixed into the same conversation with something like adaptive cruise control, which arguably is more of a driver convenience feature, has nothing really to do with safety, being mixed into the conversation with you know, level four technologies that we're working on that are really meant to only rely on the computer to do the driving and not you know, a, a human and certainly in very limited ODs and not like, all over the place all the time, at least not right away, right? And it's all happening at the same time. And so I think we need to do a much better job just continuing to reinforce that there are differences here and these differences will be with us for a very long time. You know, it takes any one piece of technology, it can take, you know, two and a half decades to penetrate uh, the fleet. And that's even after Mark was talking about if you actually regulate it, you know, the whole part be before that. So this stuff just takes time to get into the fleet. And I'm always reminded of, of airbags where, you know, that if you go back and look at the history, that was almost a two and a half decades kind of rulemaking 
onslaught. When you look at all the different pieces that got added over time, you know, no one tried to solve the whole problem all at once. You know, there was a lot of work done very methodically over a long period of time. And you can argue that's a very simple technology, right? You measure some G-forces, you apply a bag with some, some, some pyrotechnics. And what we're doing is obviously a lot different than that. And so we need to continue the education mantra with the public and be very, very clear about what we're, we're, we're talking about, which is, you know, in this panel here, for sure, we're all talking the same language, which is self-driving vehicles, not anything to do with drivers taking over and that kind of stuff. Very interesting. Thanks, Nat. Mark, what do you, what would you add here? Just quickly, I think I would just say, you know, this gets to the evolution versus revolution, right? There's some people that think we have to evolve through these technologies to get to full automation. Others, let's go directly to it. That's a hypothesis, right? I think the most important thing that Matt was just highlighting is we've got 20 or 30 years where our roadways will include people with hands on the wheels, people that have ATIS, different kinds of technologies, and full enemy. And you know, everyone who's trying to guess what it's gonna look like 30 years from now, good luck with that, right? Because you've got all these different models, all these different ways, let's do it step by step versus no, we're going right to it. Yeah, it's hard, but we'll go right to it. So I think you know, everyone who's trying to crystal ball what's happening, um, we just, we don't know, we don't know. And that's why it's so critical to make sure that we're gonna have data and that there's gonna be transparency, the trust issue you brought up, because um, this is going to be with us for at least 20 to 30 years as we're figuring this stuff out. That's a great point. James, anything to add on that? Well, absolutely. So so I think, you know, and of course, uh, Nat hit on it, uh, 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 the ADAS versus ADS, very different technologies. ADAS technologies are about assisting a human driver in driving in the driving task. And, and ADS is a completely different animal. And the, and the public and drivers need to understand the difference. That I think goes without saying. I, I, I do think though that uh, the, the process at this, the ways in which this is occurring shows the advantages of the US system of regulation. Um, the way Congress set up uh, the structure within which NHTSA regulates a motor vehicle safety, NHTSA sets very specific standards about very specific things, such as uh, ESC, for instance, or rear view cameras. Uh, but in between that, you know, in between those those uh, those points, as, as it were, NHTSA has this very broad, powerful defect authority and investigative authority, and and that provides room for innovation to occur, but also provides that oversight of safety regulation to, to ensure that the, the the safety regulator can look into whatever's being developed and take action if there is a a safety need. So I think I think you know, it, on one hand. Uh, nobody wants to be enforced against. But on the other hand, it is part of the structure and why so much of the development, I think, is occurring here in the U.S. Because there really is this latitude that for, for development and, a, as I said, a safety oversight for, uh, for this development as it continues to occur. All right. Well, uh, the other uh, topic I wanted to talk about, you know, Congress has not yet uh, passed any kind of AB legislation, but they are sounding the alarm uh, in particular about uh, the competition with China and the risk that the United States falls behind China uh, on this technology where, you know, let's face it, most of the development is happening. Even Chinese companies come to, to the U.S. to, to develop. So uh, I wonder how you see that risk. Um, Nat, let's start with you. Yeah, I think it's very real. I mean, I obviously got to serve with, with both Mark and, and James at the department. And I think we always, at least the three of us, I think, um, would talk about this issue kind of very directly. Um, you know, we've had a good run here in the U.S. We've had the technology here for well over a decade. Um, you know, kind of even going back, maybe even before that, when you talk about if you want to bring in the DARPA project into that. And I think that uh, when I watch what other countries are doing around this space, um, they're not waiting around. So you see lots of investment, of course, uh, in, in China, as you mentioned, but they're not the only ones. It's not like the Europeans are sitting around going, well, we'll just wait wait for a, a little while. And I think it, it comes down to not just a kind of a economic competitiveness for the country, but I think it comes to a, a competitive uh, for all of us as like human beings on the planet, right? We have a crisis when it comes to fatalities on our roadways. You know, this year we will likely 
approach numbers that we have not seen in a decade when it comes to motor vehicle crashes. When we arguably have the safest vehicles we've ever had, the best roads we've ever had, uh, there is something going on there. And we need to understand that this technology that we're, we're working on, no matter the product that we're sort of putting it on, whether that be robo uh, delivery or, or taxi or whatever we want to call it, that will have tremendous benefit to reshape how we think about transportation and transportation equity. And so to me, it's not just about the economic competitiveness and who's, who's going to win on the technology and all that kind of stuff. It's this other piece too, that we're losing a significant number of the population. And if you want to throw GDP numbers in there, like it's a non-trivial amount of the nation's GDP that we're losing every year to motor vehicle crashes. And so we've got to go focus there. And it just becomes a natural thing that we have it all here. Why, why aren't we doing what we need to do to make it succeed? James, you're nodding. Uh, how, what would you like to say on that topic? So, well, you know, uh, with respect to international, what's going on internationally, number one, competition is good. Uh, competition keeps everybody on, on top of their game and we want to see more competition. Everybody wants to win, but we want, you know, competition incentivizes good behavior. Um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, on one hand, you, 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 you want to be concerned about regulators anywhere acting prematurely in this space because the technology is under development and uh, regulators best regulate when the technology is known and understood and not acting prematurely. So, uh, so that's, that's something that uh, regulators acting too prematurely overseas, for instance, could, could uh, stymie uh, uh, innovation there. Um, but 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 certainly what Nat said, we have a national and indeed a global issue with with traffic safety. And one of the things that you know we had a chance to look back on last year when we did a retrospective for NHTSA's 50 years was that you know traffic fatality rates have dropped 75 percent since NHTSA was created in 1970, and that's a tremendous tremendous number. That's wonderful. And every decade of NHTSA's existence, you saw tremendous progress in the drops in the fatality rate, and that is wonderful. And until about 10 years ago or so, and over the past 10 years or so ago, this is what Nat's referring to, we've we've kind of plateaued on safety. Um, and, and and yet vehicles are safer than ever. And and then you look at what happened last year. And and I I was of course at NHTSA while during the pandemic and the uh the the fatality numbers the crash numbers that were coming in were horrific and uh, and turned upside down in such a hurry so quickly nitsa did research that showed uh, from crash victims from trauma centers that showed that two-thirds of drivers in those studies who uh who were in fatal or near fatal crashes had detectable levels of drugs or alcohol in their blood so what we're seeing is not that vehicles became less safe last year. In fact, they're safer than they've ever been. What we're seeing is that we, I think we've hit a plateau where it's human behavior is, is, is we're, we're bumping up against. And that's where this technology that we're all working on comes into play, right? It's, it's to overcome those human mistakes, that reckless human behavior that we've, we're, unfortunately, we're seeing today and continuing to see. And so, you know, this is, I think, the best hope we have of making that next big safety breakthrough. So I think that's why we're all here. And I think that's why all of our companies are so focused on the opportunities that this, uh, this uh, uh, entails. You, you know, Joanne, Mark, I, yeah, go ahead, please, Mark. I, I'm just, I'm going to do a wrap for some of this. Sadly, we're at the end of this time. And it's the first opportunity to give the number 38,680 lives lost in 2020 on US roadways, 100 every day. Einstein taught us, keep doing the same thing, expect a different outcome. That's the definition of insanity. And so if we really wanna make a difference here, technology is the new tool. And there are NHTSA studies that show that. And so that's what I'm saying. You've got three safety professionals here who, you know, our motivation is to know how this technology is gonna make a difference in that number. And so, you know, we'd be naive not to think there's global competition, but I just think, you know, at the end of the day here, at the end of this panel, for most of us, it's all about the safety and the other advantages of mobility and the climate, et cetera. But man, it is all about the lives uh, that we can save, the injuries and crashes we can prevent. And, and I just gotta say, I think technology is the new tool and we gotta figure out how far it can get us to saving those lives. That is a perfect way to end our panel.
Uh, I really uh, so want to thank all of you for your your insights today. It's really been a fascinating conversation. Uh, thanks very much. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. Uh, today, we're going to talk about what it means to drive safely in an age of automation. So first, let's ask ourselves, what do we think our future with automated vehicles is going to look like? The introduction of the automobile originally was quite chaotic. Roads at that time were for pedestrians, were for horse-drawn carriages, were for bicyclists. They weren't for these loud, uh, horseless carriages. Um, so what will happen when we introduce automated vehicles? So think about this. What if every automated vehicle on the road had its own definition of what it thought was the right thing to do when it comes to driving safely? What if every state in the country or country in Europe uh, had a de its own definition of driving safely? Well, what if every time there was an accident involving an automated vehicle, it resulted in a lawsuit to decide who in fact was driving safely and who was not? But this is the current state of affairs uh, in the industry today. And so the point here is, is that unless we can come to an agreement on what it means for an automated vehicle to drive safely, there likely will not be automated vehicles, or at the very least, they're going to be deployed on a much more limited basis uh, because of these open questions. And so this is the role of safety standards then. And so you might think, why are safety standards necessary? Well, let's look to an adjacent industry. Let's look at aerospace. Uh, when automation technologies were being introduced into aircraft in the early 90s, there started to be safety incidents. Pilots were confused about the capabilities of the automation system. It worked differently across different manufacturers. And so for the first time ever, the FAA created a new kind of team, the Commercial Aviation Safety Team, or CAST. And their role was not to look at crashes that happen, and figure out why it happened and then uh, issue regulations uh, to, to fix it, is to proactively identify in advance of the deployment of an automation technology and understand what are the possible risks and how can those risks be mitigated. So with this change, we saw one of the safest periods of air travel in the history of the industry. But it took the FAA bringing companies together and thinking about an understanding what is risk, defining it and assessing it prior to deployment so that we can make sure that we have an acceptable level of risk for these products when they're deployed. And so how are we doing in the automotive industry? I think we all know the numbers. They speak for themselves. Uh, you know, today we have 100 people dying every year because of other humans behind the wheel. But even if we were to improve that by 100x, and let's say we have only 360 folks dying every year, um, if it was uh, automation drivers behind the wheel, that's probably a front page headline. And so this kind of gets us to this question, right, of how safe is safe enough? And here's the opportunity that we have. Just like the FAA did, we have an opportunity for the first time in history to proactively set the level of safety that we desire for these machines. But in order to do that, we need to come together and understand what does driving safely mean? And that's where we propose driving safely is driving at a societally acceptable risk balance and proving that you're doing so. So first, let's consider how do machines and humans differ? Uh, as humans, we learn tricks. We have tricks like the two second rule, where we're following another vehicle and we count the number of seconds after the vehicle in front passes some marker to when that same marker hits the front of our vehicle. And so this is a trick, you know, it's a rule that we have. A lot of times it's wrong. A lot of times we need more than two seconds. Sometimes it's overly conservative and we could follow more closely if we wanted to. You know, but the thing is with automated vehicles, we don't need to guess, we have a better way. This is a formula uh, based on the responsibility sensitive safety model uh, that's really just physics. We have objects of mass in motion here and we don't want them to collide. And so from Newtonian physics, we know that if you take the velocity of each of those objects, you take their deceleration rates, you take things like the reaction time, you can calculate very precisely what is a sufficiently a distance between these two objects so that the vehicle in the rear can avoid crashing into the vehicle in front if the vehicle in front were to suddenly break. 
simple, right? Uh, and so, but there's a trick to this though. So not all of these parameters can be measured or known. So you don't need to know what all of these are, but one of these, beta max, represents an assumption about what is a reasonable and foreseeable expectation on the deceleration rate of that vehicle that I'm following. And this is not a trivial question, because if we look at different cars on the road, we have significantly different performance. If there's a high-end sports car on the road, you're likely to have a vehicle that could break at 12, 12 and a half meters per second squared. If you've got a larger truck, a bit less, but interestingly, NHTSA found in their own research that it doesn't matter what kind of vehicle a human is driving. Humans, because of our own physical capabilities, we brake with about six and a half meters per second squared. So when trying to calculate a safe following distance, what value should we use? Should we assume a theoretical worst case of 12 and a half meters per second, or maybe it's actually 20 or 30 meters per second because somebody's got an advanced uh, race car on the road? Uh, well, if we do that, what's going to happen? Uh, we're going to have longer following distances. We're going to have vehicles that annoy everyone else on the road. Uh, and we're going to have a vehicle that contributes negatively to traffic flow is causing traffic jams and you know consumers will get sick and tired of these driverless vehicles in very short order but it's a very safe vehicle right because we've chosen that global theoretical worst case on the other hand if we choose something more naturalistic say eight meters per second squared or nine meters per second squared we're going to get in a vehicle that's still much safer than human drivers but there's a non-zero chance now that we could get into a crash uh, if the vehicle in front decelerates at a rate greater than that value used so what should we pick what value and this is the thing driving is essentially a balance between safety and usefulness and this is where industry and government have different roles so industry's role here is to define these parameters that govern what it means to drive safely government's role uh, is to pick the values and actually government does this all the time when a new road is built a speed limit is selected that value for that speed limit parameter represents acceptable risk for that roadway and so if the government wanted to eliminate all injury accidents overnight around the country or around the world, we could set the global maximum speed limit to be five miles per hour. It would be incredible for safety, right? So why wouldn't we do it? Well, because of the loss of efficiency and utility of our transportation network. There are other regulations coming around electric vehicles that will require electric vehicles to emit a sound when operating below certain speeds. This is to help us hear them coming so they don't kind of creep up on us from behind. And so in this case, the government said 62 decibels. That's the number. OK, well, why wasn't it 63? Why not 70? Wouldn't 80 or 90 decibels be better for safety? Sure. But at what cost? Our hearing and annoying other people on the road. But why was it 62? Why wasn't it 60 or 50? You know, I don't know. But the point is the government went through a process, did some research and picked a value that represents acceptable risk. And so, so must we also do for automated vehicles. And so fortunately, there's a standard here to help. IEEE P2846 is a standard titled Assumptions for Models in Safety-Related Automated Vehicle Behavior. We have an incredible collection of entities that are contributing to this standard. And in this standard, we are standardizing for the industry what are the assumptions that automated vehicles need to make about other road users that govern this behavior that's going to ultimately lead to performance and so-called driving safely on the road. So in that simple car following scenario, what is the assumption that matters? We already talked about it. What is the maximum assumed longitudinal deceleration? For pedestrians, they have more advanced kinematic properties. And so for a pedestrian, sure, we have longitudinal velocity. We also have acceleration. What if a pedestrian is occluded? What should I assume is their maximum acceleration? from behind that occlusion. That's important to know as I'm navigating around that occlusion. We also have heading angle. If a pedestrian is on the sidewalk, we generally expect they're going to stay on the sidewalk as it for us as a human driver. But why do we expect that? Well, intuitively, it boils down to physics, which is their heading angle and what we intuitively know about the heading angle rate change of the pedestrian and how quickly they could turn and jump into the road. Now, on the other hand, if the pedestrian is in the road, we might expect that they could move in any direction. So we need to navigate more, more cautiously. So these are the kinds of assumptions 
that automated vehicles can make to navigate safely in the world, balancing the need to be safe with also the need to have a useful vehicle uh, at the end of the day. So our call to action then is that industry and government must align on what it means to drive safely. And ultimately assumptions are at the heart of understanding that balance uh, and, and that level of acceptable risk uh, that, that the vehicle should have. Uh, industry needs to finish these standards and the research community can help us by figuring out different methods for defining and deriving what are these acceptable values that can be used for parameters used in safety models that conform with IEEE 2846. Thank you for your time today. Our next guest is no stranger to the auto industry. Debbie Dingle won election to the Congress after her late husband, John, who was a friend and mentor to so many of us, retired. She has picked up her husband's mantle as a strong voice for companies, facilities, and employees that reside in her congressional district in Southeast Michigan. She serves on the Energy and Commerce Committee, which John Dingle chaired, and where so much legislation of interest to us is written. In fact, just about every subject we're discussing during this summit, electrification, clean energy supplies, batteries, safety, automated and connected vehicles, to name just a few, lies within the purview of energy and commerce. And Representative Dingell has authored and co-sponsored a number of important bills in these areas that are now before the Congress. Mrs. Dingell, we are delighted that you could join us, and we look forward to hearing what you have to say. It's Congresswoman Debbie Dingell from Michigan, as most of you know, and a car girl. You all wouldn't be here if you didn't know something about Michigan, but we're the global center, have been from the very beginning, the global center of the auto industry. We put the world on wheels. I've been around long enough to watch what happened to the industry post Ralph Nader as the first round of safety and environmental regulations were passed in Washington. The industry rose to the challenge and made safer and more cleaner cars. I was also around, unfortunately, in 2008, when the industry found itself at the center of a lot of very difficult conversations in Washington that impacted both the economy and what could happen in the United States. Those were really tough conversations, tore the Congress apart, quite frankly, but people couldn't let the economy collapse. Government learned along the way that helping support industry isn't a bad thing to do, but you'll find that nobody from Washington really wanted to talk about the autos for a good decade. Then came the 2020 election, where climate change, which had always been talked about a little, was front and center. It couldn't be denied anymore. The hurricanes, the wildfires, the floods, even in my own state of Michigan, people could no longer deny that climate change was real. And people also knew the importance or focused on the importance of the auto industry to both the economy and the environment. Transportation contributes 29% up to 29% of the United States greenhouse gas emissions. So when people look to address the problem, autos were right back at the center. The discussion became real about alternative technology. What could replace the internal combustion engine? And never has it become a more critical time to invest in the auto industry to look at policies that support both the industry and the workers. In August, I stood at the White House next to the president where he announced his goal to make 50% of new vehicles sold in 2030, zero emission vehicles. That was probably almost a transformative moment for the industry. When you had the president, the UAW, the auto industry, the CEOs of three of the companies and the environmentalists stood together with the same agreed upon goal. It took a lot of work. 
I still have some bruises on my body from some of those conversations. But we know we need to support the transition from internal combustion engines to electric vehicles. And quite frankly, if you're me, I'm a car girl from Michigan, we want to see them built here in America while ensuring good paying American jobs and a stronger supply chain in the United States. Right now, we are at a critical time where the decisions are gonna be made as to where and how electric vehicles are gonna be built. We've gotta make decisions and we've got to pass public policy actions that support the industry and the decisions you're making, keeping those jobs and that supply chain, bringing it back here. It's become a national security issue. China has built over 75% of the world's battery cells. It is now poised to invest another $14 billion in charging capacity in the near future. The United States of America cannot let ourselves fall behind. In Michigan, we're trying to stay ahead of the curve. We know the future of the auto industry is through zero emission electric vehicles. Ford announced a new global battery center in Southeast Michigan, so we can keep our country at the forefront of auto technology and innovation without having to cede our competitiveness overseas. We're looking at other companies locating battery plants and where are they gonna be located? We want them located here in the United States of America. It's why I introduced the Advanced Technology Vehicle Manufacturing Futures Act to modernize and expand the ATVM loan program at the US Department of Energy, which is used to build and retool auto factories in the United States that are making advanced vehicles and parts. Along those same lines, we need to build out our electric vehicle charging infrastructure if we're gonna maintain our leadership in this space. We need to encourage investment and expansion on this front. And you know what? That takes collaboration in the Congress and across the sectors. So I introduced the USA Electrify Forward Act to establish domestic manufacturing retooling grants, update building codes to encourage electric vehicle charging stations, encourage production and manufacturing jobs, and it requires states to deploy charging stations. Some of you have heard me talk about the three critical buckets when it comes to ensuring that electric vehicles are real, that consumers buy them. One, they gotta be able to afford them, period. Two, we have to develop a battery that has the range that consumers trust or have confidence in will get them where they need to go. And then we gotta build those batteries here in America. And the third bucket is building out the infrastructure, not only building the nationwide network of charging stations, but we have to update our power grid by 50%. Electric vehicles must be affordable and accessible for consumers. We do need consumer tax credits and increased investments in R&D to fuel consumer adoption and bring down the cost of vehicles right now. As I said before, I want those battery plants that so many of you are looking at here in the United States being made by American workers, which one, I hope will bring down the cost, but it'll strengthen American competitiveness around the world. And we've got to bring this supply chain back home. It's a matter of economic growth and the national security that I mentioned. Too many of our plants have been closed this year. It's, it, we're into fall. Workers are on layoffs. You're not meeting your sales projections because you can't produce the vehicles. Prices are up. It's just not an ideal economic situation. And we need to build modern infrastructure to support these high-speed charging stations 
and we, as I said, have to advance the power grid so that it can support mass adoption and use of electric vehicles. I am also actively engaged with my colleagues to find a way forward, a new legislation that would establish a federal framework for the swift yet safe deployment of highly automated vehicles. Michigan's also working to advance AVs with a corridor between Ann Arbor and Detroit, so we can build the infrastructure needed for vehicles of the future. Now is the time to act, to support our workers, to address climate change, to ensure that the United States does not cede our competitiveness. And much of this is all part of the Build Back Better Act, which is why we need this agenda and the bipartisan infrastructure framework to move forward. We have responsibility to our workers and to our future generations to keep jobs here in the United States of America at home and to protect our planet with a cleaner economy. So we're gonna to continue to have these discussions in Congress and we need your help to advocate for this too. We're all in this fight together. Remember that this industry is still, I think, the backbone of the American economy and quite frankly, of the world economy for many countries. Thank you for listening to this today. And it's an important time to be having this conference. Thank you, Representative Dingell, for joining us today. As a self-described car girl from Michigan, you raised some important points. Global leadership in designing, engineering, and building electrified vehicles rests on our ability to develop charging and fueling infrastructure and a grid to support them so that we can continue to be the country putting the world on wheels. I might add that we're going to rely on Representative Dingell and many other friends and allies to reach our goals. Without a national framework or strategy on electrification, automation, and connectivity, we run the risk of losing leadership to other countries. And that's a perfect transition to our next panel. I can't think of a better group of people to dive into the challenges ahead. Our moderator, Genevieve Cullen, from the Electric Drive Transportation Association will lead the conversation about what's needed to realize a net zero carbon transportation future. Genevieve is an expert in energy policy and in advanced technology solutions to energy and environmental challenges. This should be a great discussion and welcome Genevieve. Thanks John, I'm happy to be here. I'm Genevieve Cullen, president of the Electric Drive Transportation Association, and I'll be moderating this next panel where we'll discuss the electric future of transportation. We are all seeing explosive growth in electric vehicle sales and in the deployment of charging infrastructure, but we all know at the same time that it's going to take advances in technology, in markets and policies, rapid advances to get to the goals we all want to achieve. Joining me to explore these questions and how to get to our ambitious goals for electric transportation, we have a distinguished set of panelists, Kristen Seaman from GM, Terry Travis from EV Noir, and Lincoln Wood from Southern Company. Um, well, well, let's get into it. Um, you know, I, I think what's very top of mind for the folks in the audience is uh, are, are the many goals that have been established for electrification for the EV industry. Um, in particular, the administration um, announced a, a goal of 40 to 50 percent EV sales uh, by 2030. That's pretty ambitious. Um, uh, Kristen, can you talk about how, to, how do we get there from here? Sure. So at General Motors, we're committed to a zero emissions, all electric future. Uh, we made some bold announcements last year of our commitment to be climate neutral by 2040 and our aspiration to eliminate tailpipe emissions from all new light duty vehicles by 2035. We've made some big announcements as far as our investment of $35 billion by 2025. We've announced that we're going to be introducing 30 new EVs by that time frame as well across the globe. And, and that'll be really across all segments, 
um, across all price points so that we see a, a future where everybody's in an EV. We're very pleased to have joined in a statement of shared aspiration along with our Ford and Stellantis of achieving 40 to 50% of annual U.S. sales volumes of electric vehicles by 2030. And for GM, that means battery electric vehicles. We're, we're all in on an all electric future. And to reach this high end of that range, we're going to continue to work with the Biden administration, with Congress, with state and local governments to make sure that we implement supportive policies that are for the benefit of our workforce, our partners in the UAW, our dealers, our customers, and also in the communities. We, we really feel that this transition needs to include everybody. It needs to be equitable and um, make sure that nobody's left behind. Thank you. Um, that, that's, that's a pretty good size to do list. Um, Terry and, and Lincoln, obviously, um, we all understand that this, this is more than cars, right? Uh, that changing transportation involves uh, many pieces of this ecosystem. What would you say is, uh, is are the important milestones uh, for achieving uh, an electrified future and hitting that 30, that 40 to 50% of EV sales by 2030? Lincoln, you want to take a run at it? Of course. So, you know, I think it's interesting working for a utility, unlike you know, working for a car maker where you have a product that people can touch and feel and they look at and they can sit in. The company I work for produces a product that you don't want to touch um, and hopefully you don't encounter it. But if we do our jobs right, when you come downstairs in the morning and you hit your light switch, the light comes on, you make your coffee, you start about your day. And it's not necessarily about the product that we produce. It's what it does. And so from a utility standpoint, as we think about an electrified future, one of the things that the industry is working on and us at Southern particularly is, you know, what is the impact to our transmission and distribution grid as it relates to switching over the transportation sector to electric? Because that's not just light duty, that's medium and heavy duty vehicles as well. And I'll give you an example. If you think about fleet electrification, where you may have a distribution um, depot or whatnot, and you have a warehouse that sits there with just a little bit of lighting and some HVAC for the office space. And all of a sudden you have 50 or 100 vehicles that are going to sit there overnight and have to be charged. But what does that look like for our grid? And what, what does that mean for you know, the future? If we think about generation that if we put more renewables on the system and we have more solar during the middle of the day right now, we have time of use rates that encourage customers to charge overnight. So working through what that looks like uh, and planning. So that's one thing that utilities do well is plan, especially long term, so that it will continue to be that you come downstairs in the morning. It's a cold day outside, but you hit the light switch. The light comes on, you make your coffee and life goes on and your vehicles also get charged. So it's um, definitely a challenge, but we are definitely up for that challenge um, and excited to see you know where we go. Thanks, Lincoln. Um, actually, so Terry, in addition to um, morning coffee and, and a full charge, what, what do you think, it's, uh, what do we need to be thinking about to accelerate this transition? The, thank you for that question. There are a number of, of factors and things that we have to really begin to explore. Um, one of the things that we can do is not reinvent the wheel. We can take a look at what is happening in the more mature markets and begin to replicate some of those things. So if we think about what's happening in the European Union, where they are looking at expanding infrastructure um, across the uh, territory or across the region to include charging infrastructure approximately about every 37 miles, so it becomes more ubiquitous. And ensuring that we think about this across modes, as Lincoln was, uh, you know, speaking to the, the the matter of fact is is that it's not going to be just the electrification of light duty passenger vehicles, but we're going to have to look at everything from e-bikes and scooters all the way up to class eight heavy duty freight vehicles and electrifying all across all of those modes will really begin to promote a cleaner and greener future for all of us that I think will be beneficial over a myriad of ways. I think that's a, that's a really good point. I, I think uh, often the conversation people it drifts uh, naturally to light duty vehicles because you see so many of them, but electric transportation is in fact a, a, a quite um, varied variety of, of technologies and, and drive cycles um, to advance across all of these uh, technologies and drive cycles. Um, obviously, it's not just uh, the 
the bold work of, of industries like GM and Southern Company, there's there's a role for um, the, the public and the private sector in moving forward. And and maybe Terry, you could build on that a little bit more. What how what is that interplay with between public and private sector in 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 advancing this and at the pace we needed to go? Yeah, I mean, so to reach some of the um, decarbonization and climate goals that any number of companies and, and, and organizations like GM and Southern Company and others have, and then thinking about this from a public vantage point and how we can actually begin to advance in a way, one of the things that we have to be mindful of is that it's a triple bottom line opportunity that moves well beyond just the mobility transportation sector. It really has those overarching implications to be able to create, you know, UC Berkeley's latest report uh, estimates that it will create 2 million additional jobs, which I think is, is a critical piece of this. And we've seen a lot of conversation about this at the federal level. Um, in addition to that, it addresses a cleaner and greener mobility future. And then in addition to that, the public health uh, implications that we all see and, and need that affect all of us, I think are critically important to that. And so as we begin to examine how and why we're going to make these decisions, um, it's going to be important that we take a wider panoramic view to see what will work best for us and how we can implement those things in a way that is going to benefit all segments of the community and expand uh, adoption rates across modes and sectors and, and communities. Uh, thank you. I think that's that's exactly right. I mean, engaging the, that relationship between the public and private sector and making a comprehensive and equitable transition is is going to be so important. Um, Lincoln, do you want to talk a little bit about how how Southern Company engages um, with regulators and the community to to communicate your mission and what you need? Of course. So one thing that I think is so fascinating about electric mobility is that the skill set that you need is not really found in one place, that we all own a piece of it. And I see that throughout, even at Southern Company with the different areas that I have involved, whether it's sales and marketing or power delivery, or if it's an R&D or whatnot. One of the projects I've been working on um, closely with the University of Georgia, which happens to be my alma mater, but also very conveniently located about an hour from me, is the development of an e-mobility certificate that will be housed in the College of Engineering, but will be multidisciplinary to Terry's point, because I view this really in kind of three ways. There's a battery and technology and vehicle tech piece. There's an infrastructure and charging piece, and there's also a corporate piece. And so one of the things I think about, for example, is if you happen to work for a fleet company and you need to know how electric vehicles operate and what, how the technology operates, but you also need to understand supply chain and logistics, and those skills might be found in a business school, for example, not in a college of engineering. So how do you sew something together so that at the end of the day, I'm developing the next generation of workforce of the workforce that can work in this field and be prepared for it versus all of us who we're all kind of figuring this out as we go. And that's you know not a slam on any of us, it's just that the technology is changing. How do I prepare the next set of workers that are ready for that? Um, and UGA also has an uh, innovation district, so we're trying to tie this e-mobility certificate in to, kind of, to that piece, which is research um, and then also talent development piece to connect all of that. And even broader is connecting that with the rest of the university system of Georgia, so maybe developing curriculum and working with satellite schools or whatnot, and also regional schools in Southern's footprint, such as University of Alabama and Mississippi State, to try to get the conversation going, because I firmly believe that this takes all of us, we're all players at the table, and Genevieve, to your earlier question about regulators, I had this conversation uh, at CROG earlier in the fall of um, in order for us to get where we need to get, everyone has a seat at the table to figure out what, what our individual role would be. So whether that's workforce development, whether that's figuring out you know, what our next set of grid planning needs to look like and how our next iteration of EV infrastructure programs need to be set up and rolled out, whatever that looks like, we're all there. But I do feel strongly that from the workforce development side, that's a critical piece that we have to solve if we're going to make this transition. Uh, Kristen, can you talk about what public and private sector actions it's going to take for US for the US to achieve a 40 to 50 percent penetration of EV in sales? Absolutely. And as Lincoln mentioned, you know, the 
the area of the future of work is really important. And at GM, you know, we really believe that the transition to all electric carbon neutral needs to be inclusive. It needs to be for everybody. So earlier this year, we announced our equitable climate action, which is an initiative to ensure that that happens, that nobody's left behind. Left behind. It includes our, our current and future workforce, customers and communities, and particularly communities that may be more likely to disproportionately experience the effects of climate change. And that initiative has four key areas. The first one is very much to what Lincoln talked about with the future of work and bringing our workforce along on the journey and building a pipeline of diverse talent for those future jobs. Um, the other three areas are EV access. We're making sure that we provide access for all people to benefit from electrification. Um, again, whether it's anything from ride sharing to the transportation of goods and services, and then infrastructure equity, um, and then climate equity, again, to make sure that we, we take care of those communities and that we live and we work in, and everybody's part of this transition to the all electric future. Thank you, Kristen. I, and then that's a, a, a critical piece of this as we have this opportunity uh, to reimagine transportation and to make sure that the benefits of electrification, which are not just uh, cheaper fuel, it's, it's better air quality, it's more livable communities. Um, at, and as, as Terry pointed out, it's also the, the platform for the uh, automated and connected technologies that, that actually create even greater access to transportation. Um, how, what, what do we need to be aware of as we get this chance to, to, to tweak and, and remap transportation? Lincoln, what, how, do you see, how does Southern see that as part of your mission of electrification? So Genevieve, if we're thinking about consumer education, I have three words, if you remember nothing else I say today, butts and seats. It works every single time. You get someone to get in an electric vehicle, and have them experience what the what driving one is like, they're, they're, they're hooked. And I will say that happened for myself as well. One of the things that Southern has done, um, we've done several um, consumer education activities where we've had uh, targeted maybe YouTube videos, depending on across social media, what your interests are. Uh, we've had um, many, many ride and drive events. I know we've actually partnered with Terry's organization on a couple of those as well. And one that we found to be particularly um, capital intensive, so it doesn't scale very easily, but I found it to be very effective, was one that we did called Cars and Coffee, where we invited a set of customers out, rented out a coffee shop for the day, and had what we had what we called EV concierge staff on site, and they could come in and, and look at different makes and models of EVs and really ask us any question that they wanted around EVs, and we took as much time with them as we needed to. The question I got that day that has still sticks with me is this, this particular location was at a beach. And so the question I got was, well, does the salt air impact the battery packs? Because in beach locations, sometimes the car will rust through before it wears out. And how does that affect the electric drivetrain? And my answer, so I'm hoping if there's people on this call that you know can tell me if I said this wrong, please follow up afterwards. But my answer was the pack is sealed and you know that should not be an issue. So I just always think that is a particularly um, Poignant question because it's not one that you're likely to get if you happen to just go casually shopping for a car. That was really, I, you know, that person gave that some thought and that was a, a real concern of theirs because that reflected their reality. So um, any chance we have to, to touch customers and reach out to them and, you know, educate them more on the benefits of electrification is absolutely a win. That's a really good point. And, um, and uh, for those of us who are uh, advocates and educators on electric transportation, so it's good to be reminded that there is uh, there are some recurring questions about electric transportation, and then there are ones that speak to everyone's unique relationship to how they get around. Right? What is what is your concern? Um, we know for a lot of us, it's you know how can I get to my grandmother's house in in my in my plug-in vehicle? Um, uh, the answer is yes, um, no matter where she lives, uh, both because infrastructure is expanding so rapidly um, with, in fact, I think the DOE is saying there's more than 100,000 public charging points in the United States today. And that's, that's we certainly need more, uh, but we also need uh, consumers to understand um, not only the vehicles and, you know, whether you can plug them in in the rain, 
that's one I get a lot. Um, uh, but also their charging options and and what's out there and how to how to find that. Um, so the this, the consumer piece of this and these differently located consumers, uh, making them see and feel the benefits aside from getting in the car. Um, you know how how can we uh, how can we reach communities and consumers who um, we have yet to reach on that front? Um, Terry, did you want to? take a first run at that? Sure. Um, that's one of the areas of focus that we have been really zeroed in on. So um, separate from our consultancy, we have a membership organization, which is the nation's largest network of diversity drivers and enthusiasts. And we are uh, one of the four conveners of National Drive Electric Week, which is really um, one of the premier events engaging consumers. In addition to that, we've done a lot of data analysis and research around attitudes, knowledge, and beliefs of consumers. So really moving beyond where we are now to expand the proverbial EV tent is going to take a lot of concerted effort. What we know is in our partnership with a lot of academic institutions as well as uh, other agencies, what we know is that when we're doing this research, what we find very often is, is that there is an interest or inclination for folks who want to know more about EVs. And it's probably um, seen a tremendous uptick because there have been more commercials and more conversations and articles about EVs over the last year than we've seen, you know, quite some time or ever in the space. And so with that being said, we know that that consumer education and engagement is going to be critically important as we begin to move beyond the early adopter phase. One of the things that um, we have been very um, zeroed in on is how you are able to engage those who have been traditionally underrepresented in these community in these conversations that's critically important um we know that you know transportation electrification is a great um high level talking point but what mobility means for specific communities is access to grocery stores access to social services access to to jobs and so what happens is that as we move forward in this conversation we're thinking about this across modes whether those are private you know privately owned vehicles or we're looking at electric buses whether we're looking at electric school buses it's going to take concerted efforts for communities to be engaged and educated on the benefits of electrification um beyond where we are now if we're going to see an uptick in adoption i can point to any number of states where we have policy in place but we really have to have policy along with the engagement, as Lincoln mentioned, uh, really getting butts and seats to see this uptick in adoption and move beyond this uh, point that we are now. Thank you. Um, Kristen, you, you uh, as a, a provider of vehicles, you have a, per, a particular relationship with your with your customers and and your consumers and and educating them, you know, using a platform of uh, of, of trust and you know, you're my automaker. Um, how how are what's your strategy for for consumer education? Yeah, thank you. So I I couldn't agree more with um, what both Lincoln and Terry said. It it really is once once a customer experiences an electric vehicle, it is extremely difficult to go back. And also, as Terry mentioned, it's important to make sure that everybody can see themselves in an EV. So it it does go back to um, both a product line that's exciting and uh, fun to drive and looks great, which uh, GM's products are, are very well known for. Um, but it's also making sure that um, everybody can see themselves in that vehicle and that we have something available in all of the segments, in all of the uh, price points. And then making sure that when we say electrification is accessible, it really means making sure that charging access is accessible as well. You know, we've grown up and been conditioned not to worry about running low on gas because there's a gas station every few miles. There wasn't one every few miles when the cars first came to be. Um, you know, most people who own EVs plug their cars in at night, very similar to a, a mobile phone. But if you don't have a garage or street access, they worry about charging availability. So we're working um, both internally and externally on, on ways to address that. We've introduced a, a system or an app called Ultium Charge 360, which really is a, it's an innovative and holistic approach that integrates charging networks with our mobile apps and other products and services 
so that it simplifies the, the charging experience for the customer. Um, there needs to be more access to public chargers and we're providing um, that in based on our extensive industry partnerships. We've installed DC fast chargers along 50,000 miles of highway so that you can see that path, uh, whether it be to your grandma's house or, or to your vacation place. And then working with dealers to install charging outlets there, um, helping EV owners with their home charging outlets. Uh, again, it, we believe that it needs to be everybody. Everybody needs to be part of that solution. Um, and that way it makes that all electric future inclusive for everyone. So getting customers to be able to see themselves in that product and how it works for, for their lifestyle and, and, and what they need that, that product for. Thank you. You're, you're exactly right. Everyone needs to be able to see themselves um, in some form of electric transportation. I know, um, and Lincoln, I, as in addition to your, uh, your ride and drive opportunities, I think uh, Southern does a fair amount of, of consumer education about options as well, right? As again, you now there, there is this the shared customer, right, between the utility companies and, and, and the car companies. And um, um, what are the other uh, measures of consumer education that, that Southern Company is working on? So in, in terms of, you know, not just vehicles, Genevieve, we also have, you know, pricing and rate plans to encourage charging overnight, for example. In our Georgia Power subsidiary, we have a um, time of use EV charging rate that is about one cent per kilowatt hour from 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. So we encourage, you know, if you drive an electric vehicle and can provide proof that you own it or lease it, then you're allowed to be on that rider, right? And that's a really... Um, compelling reason to switch to, to electric vehicles. So I think on our website, we have something like $19, 20 bucks to charge that EV per month versus the cost of gas, which of course fluctuates with gas prices. But I mean, the, the difference is incredible. So, you know, beyond that, we have fleet applications of, you know, fleet as a service for companies that are considering jumping in and electrifying their fleet and how they get there. So that's fleet advisory or consulting or infrastructure, you know, whatever that, that looks like. At the end of the day, we know that, uh, to your point, Genevieve, it is a shared customer, but we have a very large role to play as the energy provider, and we do infrastructure really well because that's the business that we're in. So trying to figure out how that works together so that we're all helping the society really navigate toward our end goal of electrifying the transportation sector. It's, it's a really important goal to achieve. Back to our first question, right? If we Are we gonna get there by 20, 2030? Um, I don't know, but I think we all have to be at the table to get us there. Mm -hmm. No, I think that's uh, that, exactly right, Lincoln. And, that, and to that point, I was thinking about this too, um, you know, your utility, um, in fact, uh, is, is a, um, you know, a service provider you're in, in fairly regular contact with, it's not just your monthly bill, right? That they have a, a fairly regular outreach. Um, my utility um, sends me a fair amount of, 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 of text to remind me of, you know, when my power might be on, off, or um, of what's ahead. So there's lots of pathways there for uh, for consumer and, and public education. Terry, what do you think are the other ways outside of these established channels? What are other ways to educate um, consumers and communities are the, you know, as again, I, um, I'm not going to use that phrase, but the getting folks in cars, yes, is is good. But how else do you? Um, what are the other um, effective ways to um, to get catch the attention and the the interest of other of communities and consumers? Yeah. Um, so, you know, the work that we do is right at the intersection of of what you know we're Lincoln and and Southern Company and GM. Um, is as well, but it's really about creating those touch points. The idea is, is that for the average consumer, um, we have to create a ecosystem that they see themselves participating in this and benefiting from it. We're at an inflection point where we're seeing more conversation about uh, electric vehicles than we ever have. Um, but we're also at a point where we're, we've experienced over a century um, or a hundred years of habit with fossil fuel. So the idea is, is that there is a history there. So we're at a point of this disruption. So creating those touch points where consumers, fleet managers, folks who use, utilize public transit, um, micromobility 
are able to see how they can benefit from a real world way. Creating those touch points, I think, is going to be critical because that is also going to be what I think um, informs and drives policy decisions as well um, as those folks who are um, regulating and uh, drafting policy measures. It's going to be how that relates back to their households and the households of their neighbors and, and others that are you know, often underrepresented as well. And so I think that creating those touch points is, is critically important so that you know, folks are able to see how they can benefit from this in a real world way. That is something that we experience and work on on a daily basis. Thank you. And I think we are, um, I'm sorry to say we're almost out of time. So I would like to just take this little uh, couple minutes here and give you all an opportunity um, since we are standing at this, um, at this inflection point, this juncture where um, we have the ability that there's a path for transforming transportation, but we have to get this right. And there's a lot of pieces that need to move together thoughtfully um, and quickly. And so I would um, ask you all just take a, a couple seconds and tell me what would you like the people in this audience, this distinguished audience of the folks in the EV value chain, what should they take away? What what do they need to be focusing on to help us all get there? I'm going to make ask Kristen to start. Sure. So at, at GM, we're absolutely committed to an all electric future, and we want that all electric future to be an inclusive one and for everyone to be part of that. Our EV portfolio will cover all capabilities, all product segments, all price points so that all customers can participate. And we're committed to continue to work with, with governments, our UAW partners, our dealerships, et cetera, to make sure that we all work on the solutions to enable that all electric future for everyone. So I'll just say, as we think about the load, tying back to our beginning of the conversation around grid infrastructure, at, here at Southern, we don't we don't view the load that electric vehicles provide any different than any other load that we would typically plan for. So we and we've integrated that into our planning process already. So you know, the takeaway here to me is you know utilities are on top of it. We know that this is coming. We're planning for it, and that we also have I mean, to our earlier conversation a shared customer that we will be working with, with many of us in this in this whole ecosystem to enable the transition and happy to be a, a partner in that conversation. Yeah, I would just say at this time of disruption, I mean, we have an opportunity to create, you know, great and, and, and good paying jobs, address public health issues, and then really address this through the lens of, you know, um, how do we begin to create a better and different mobility and transportation ecosystem that benefits all communities? I think that those three opportunities are, are the things that I would like to just leave us with because I think that those are critical to advancing the conversation. Great. Thanks to all of you and, and thank you, John and Auto Innovators. We're fortunate to have leadership in our association and at the Auto Dealers Association that understands the value of manufacturers and retailers working together. Paul Walzer is a second generation auto dealer in his Minneapolis area home, and he is the chairman of the National Automobile Dealers Association. Chris Reynolds is the chief administrative officer of Toyota Motor North America, and also the chairman of the board of Auto Innovators. Paul and Chris are helping lead our efforts to get federal and state policies that support continued innovation in all aspects of the industry, from new products through to the retail and service experience. They joined for a conversation in their roles as the chairman of NADA and Auto Innovators on the future of electrification and what we're going to need to establish electric vehicles in the mass market. Well, you know, the, the Biden administration has this super ambitious goal, which we all believe in, to by 2030 transform how cars operate from mostly an internal combustion-based powertrain to electrified vehicles, be that plug-in hybrid fuel cell or full-on battery electric. The customer has to feel comfortable buying into this vision car by car by car 
and it's that relationship between the customer and the dealer that's going to make it happen. And so when we talk about you know, achieving this ambitious and needed goal, it's going to have to be a partnership between the dealers and the OEMs. If we are going to achieve these very bold goals from the Biden administration, 40 to 50 percent electric products by 2030, this is going to take all hands on deck. This is going to take dealers investing in charging stations, investing in the tools, doing the training, the OEMs making the new products that are available in the mainstream to everyday consumers. This is a tall order, but the dealers and the manufacturers have a history of this and we can do this. What I'm seeing from dealers right now across the country is a real understanding that this is a time for us to invest in what consumers really want, mm. which is they want a more transparent experience, they want this to be faster, mm. uh, and at the end of the day, they want to control this process. Mm. And dealers across the country are working on these things right now. So I think what you're going to see as this transition moves forward is an incredible improvement in the overall customer experience as we continue to work together to simplify the model and deliver what the customer really wants. You know, as you were talking about it, I was thinking, you know, what we as Toyota and other OEMs think about, we have brand trust, right? The consumer, the customer trusts the brand. But then you have sort of that relationship trust and they are going to rely on you and your colleague dealers to tell them how, how is this going to work? How quickly can it move along? Or can it move along according to my speed as a customer? I think what's maybe been left out of the conversation mm -hmm. till now mm -hmm. is how critical it is that the legacy OEMs, yourselves and others that have been working with dealers for a hundred years, mm -hmm. because up until now this has been, you know, niche vehicles at, at high ends, but we need to get these in the mass markets if we're going to have success in, in achieving this administration's goals, which I personally think are achievable. But the only way we're going to get there mm. is with people like Toyota and, and others working with dealers to get products into the, into the mainstream, and then I think we can have success. You know, I think there are three big ingredients to that success. One is we, the OEMs, Toyota in particular, we need to generate the right kind of product for the customer. And we need to make sure that that product fits the customer's needs, which as you know, with all your dealerships and all of the dealers that are represented, th those vary wildly, right? They, they're all across the lot, but we need to have products that meet that customer's expectation. Second is you guys, as the dealers, you're the ones talking to the customers, persuading them, educating them, getting them comfortable with the product. Mm -hmm. But the third piece that's a toughie is infrastructure. How are we going to get that electrified vehicle infrastructure, that hydrogen fuel infrastructure, to actually fuel the vehicles that the customers eventually buy from you? Currently, uh, electric vehicles, battery electric vehicles, are usually the second or third vehicle in the customer's portfolio. But in order to meet the administration's goals by 2030, we're going to have to transition to a point where everybody's primary car is an electrified vehicle, be it plug-in hybrid, battery electric, or even fuel cell. At the same time, and here's another challenge, that doesn't mean that we neglect all the great people who bought internal combustion engine vehicles and they're going to still buy them. Yep. So you're, we're going to have to basically ride two horses at the same time. Yep. Yeah. That's going to be a challenge. Right? But, but those are the fun challenges, yeah. right, right, of our industry. That's what keeps dealers in this game year after year after year. It's why you're here, mm. because every day is different. Every every new opportunity, every challenge, I should say, that comes our way creates a new opportunity. And we've been meeting those challenges for a long time together. Mm. The partnership that we've enjoyed with Toyota and with other OEMs uh, has been stunning. And I, I'm just looking forward to the next chapter because, yeah, honestly, Chris, I, th I think we can achieve these things. Dealers are all in on this EV thing. They are so excited about the products that are coming out in the next 24 months and beyond. And we're going we're gonna to meet these, uh, these goals, and, and it's going to be fantastic. You know, I'm, I'm really excited about it because I know at some point when I do have grandchildren, I'll be able to tell them. I was there at the point in time where we shifted personal mobility from internal combustion to electrified vehicles. And, and I saw the, the transformation of our whole uh, personal transportation network through dealers like you, 
and through great brands like Toyota. Well, thank you very much, and it's been a real pleasure working with you guys over the years as well, Chris. Excellent. The discussion we've just heard underscores the importance of aligning all automotive stakeholders and policymakers during this time of transition. The ultimate test of success is going to be how the consumer responds to electrified, automated, and connected transportation. Our industry has built cars and trucks for more than a century. We've now moved into a new era where we are launching and providing services that will improve and expand our personal mobility options, accelerating the transition to cleaner, safer, and smarter transportation. The topics we explored today are crucial to the auto industry's future and crucial to national competitiveness. The race toward electrification, automation, and connectivity is an international race to draw future supply lines, set the running rules, and establish international market leadership. We've heard about the state of the auto market and what consumers want from us. We've heard about the challenges and opportunities bringing AVs and EVs to market. We got a picture of the political landscape that we have to navigate to craft public policies that support the industry's transformation. Tomorrow, our discussion will continue on the cutting edge of innovation. We'll hear from more experts and thought leaders on the forces and factors changing what we drive and how we drive, and what we make and where we need to make it. We'll look at safety and supply chains. We will hear from both the Secretary of Energy and one of the world's foremost geopolitical analysts on issues that are driving private sector investments and public policy debates of consequence to our industry. We hope you're finding our program educational and entertaining. We look forward to seeing you again tomorrow as we continue our discussion of how we're transforming the way the world drives. Thank you.